plus day of the NSSF career expo that is going virtually for the very first time in 10 years. We're excited to be getting to the very last day and we hope for those that are attending, you're going to walk away feeling different from those that were not able to attend this expo. Like I said yesterday, you're stuck with me. I am your moderator, Sandra Twinovdio. I am a news anchor working with NTV Uganda. I am also an entrepreneur in fashion, youth guidance, and also digital marketing. Now, this entire expo has been focused on repurposing your career goals to the new normal. We know a lot of things are happening in this generation. Technology, COVID-19, that and so much more. This theme has been divided in three sub-themes and the very first day we looked at how you can purpose your new ideas and opportunities beyond the university degree. Yesterday we looked at matching your capabilities to the changing world by of course doing a number of things. You know you need to stay curious, keep learning. From our speakers yesterday they mentioned that you have to stay hungry. Look for opportunities while you wait for the bigger opportunity. So much more was said yesterday. I do not want to go through it. I do want us to right away get into our sub theme today which is preparing yourself for the current versatile job market but before we get into that we do want to say thank you to our sponsors of this entire expo nssf we do say thank you for thinking about the young people and wishing to guide them in their future career journey we also want to say thank you to nmg for making this possible and also for giving back to the younger population our speakers in this expo have been very deliberate in educating us showing us the way and sharing their experiences on how best we can all perform or compete favorably uh, on the market. Now, when we talk about uh, versatility, we know that the current job market is constantly changing. The difference now is that it is doing so, so fast. Because of technology, there's COVID also that came through and the world was taken by surprise. And of course, the aspiring workforce continues to, to look for new ways to keep up with jobs that require individuals with multiple skills. So versatility of the job, you could be looking at it in the simplest terms. It could mean that some jobs could be faced out, even when some students in universities and other institutions of higher learning are still looking forward to have to get out and do the same jobs. This morning we are privileged to actually we are going bigger. Today we are having five, you know, five speakers than we did yesterday, and we hope that will benefit you even more. On our panel today we have two ladies, and I always love to start with the ladies. Uh, we have Juliana Kagwa, who is uh, the Director of uh, Corporate Relations UBL, and she's going to be joining us online. You're going virtually, so that means you can join us anywhere you are. So Juliana Kagwa is going to be joining us online. I do hope we can see her so that the students watching us this morning can see her as well. We are excited to have you, Juliana, on the panel today. We are looking forward to learning from your expertise and getting to feel that whatever we are going through at this point in time, we are not alone, that you two were there and you give us the perfect uh, sort of experience. We are eager to learn from you, Juliana. So welcome this morning to the very last day of the NSSF Career Expo. We Yes. I am an era of uh, digital transformation, so I am joining you from uh, Ibidi, which is way beyond Kabale, way past Kanumu. Mm. Uh, so just for the Bulldog, but I'm really excited to be part of the panel. All right. We also have Barbara Arimi, and she's with us in the room. She's the head of marketing and communication communications here at NSSF. We are glad to have you on the panel today. She Thank is you. also the board member of DFCU. Good to have you on the panel this morning. Thank you so much. Very excited to be here. All right. Now on to the gents uh, that I think dressed the part. Uh, we'll start with my immediate left. Uh, Geoffrey Sajabi, he is the head of business here at NSSF and maybe later he will let us know why it's important for us to be having a conversation of young people registering for NSSF later. We're excited to have you on the panel today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure um, being here today. All right. And uh, finally, uh, we have a gentleman that has made it his life mission to encourage people. I think every single time he meets you, he will ask you, what are you doing? What, what new thing are you doing? What's, what's that one idea that you're bringing to, 
to us. He's always asking me that. Uh, that is CK Jaffeth, and he is uh, the founder of Innovation Village. Good to meet you here again. I'm excited to share ideas with young people and also learn from them about how we can all build a, a better nation. All right. So there you have it. Uh, well, dear students, uh, dear young people watching us this morning, do remember whatever we talk about here, and you want some bit of clarity, you can go right away to our social media platforms, use the hashtag NSSF Expo 2021, and ask yourself a way. They're here to give you all the answers that you've been looking for, and uh, we'll do that so well. So to our panelists, I do want to start with Juliana, who's joining us from so far away. Uh, we hope you, you can hear me again. When you listen to this sub-theme this morning, preparing yourself for the current versatile market, what comes to mind? Have I evolved enough? Am I transforming myself? We talk about digital transformation, but it cannot happen in the absence of the people who are using or utilizing um, the digital um, uh, uh, technology. Uh, we cannot happen without us transforming ourselves and also upskilling ourselves. So I think for me, um, the last 12 months or so have been about, am I doing enough to evolve with a globe or a world that's um, almost spinning, um, you know, uh, on its axis compared to where we were in the last decade. Yeah. Thank you so much, Juliana. Well, just now throwing it back to the uh, panelists here with me, I do want to start with you, CK Jaffeth. When you look at what has been happening in the world, we are having, we are being hit by experiences that we are not prepared for before COVID-19. But then there's also the other aspect of technology. As the founder of Innovation Village, you interact with young people on a daily. But what is your experience? How have you stayed relevant to the versatile, uh, versatile environment that we're working in now? Thank you for that question. And I think it's the essence of uh, what we do as an entrepreneurs in trying to build solutions that solve our biggest problems or create value in new uh, ways that, that solve problems. So we realized when COVID hit, for example, that uh, no one did have the solutions for the day, the entire globe, you know, the projections that uh, Africa is going to suffer the most, all the income to life, and everybody has you know, been struggling uh, with how do we deal um, with uh, the challenges that COVID has brought, and even unemployment, um, given how many young people are looking for other jobs. So in the entrepreneurial mindset and the young people we work with, uh, of course we had a number of them struggle in business, mm -hmm. uh, some actually shut down, but we noticed that given no one has the answers, uh, COVID actually kick-started what we know as the low-touch economy, the digital economy when you're on TV and you hear you know, the president or the minister of trade talking about e-commerce. So we saw so many entrepreneurs come up during this period to provide solutions you know, to problems, whether it's you know, telemedicine health, a number of them. It was a moment that gave birth to who an entrepreneur is uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. And so in that context, and, and when thinking about a young person who's looking to repurpose uh, their career or the opportunities because, uh, you know, career you have to think, the job market is already strained. Mm. Um, I, I call on them to, to, to think of solving problems, yes. you know, big problems, big broken pro problems, like I like calling them, but problems that are also faced by millions of people. Mm. And that's where you can begin to make a contribution 
that's where you can begin to matter and that's where you can you know open up new opportunities uh, for yourself thank you uh, ck over to you barbara when i look at you i i know uh, after looking at your cv you are ahead uh, of 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 a, f a particular field how have you kept relevant in this field Um, that's a very good question. I would say uh, reinventing myself mm. to the new way of doing things. You've talked about a versatile market. Yes, the market has been versatile in terms of, first of all, new ways of doing things. Uh, now we have to work from home. About 40% uh, of the staff are working actually at the fund, but the majority are working from home. So uh, as a leader, you have to refocus. You have to get new supervision skills. You, you now have to find ways of um, inspiring your team to deliver even when you're not together. So, so that's a first. Also, I see um, actually growing opportunities, mm -hmm. opportunities for businesses to operate in a more efficient manner. And uh, for the fund, the first thing we did was to say, okay, can we push all our services online? And that is when we, we actually decided to even uh, quickly innovate and ensure that benefits processing was available online. And so we refocused the customers to all the channels online and told them you can now do everything online. So even the communication was more about service delivery, efficiency, and of course with an aspect of empathy around COVID. So quickly what I could see is how do you as an organization, how agile are you, you know, first of all, to ensure that you change according to the needs of the market. Secondly, as an individual in that organization, how you, do you also remain agile mm. so that you're not stuck to your old way of doing things? We, for example, used to do our annual members meeting, you know, in a room with, let's say, about a thousand people. But because of the new normal, we had to take it online and we had over 30,000 people in attendance. So then we realized, okay, this is a new way of doing things but still it's actually relevant and you get more impact. Mm. So I see the, the versatile aspect actually as an opportunity for people to reinvent themselves and come up with also new ways of doing things as opposed to getting stuck in your old ways and saying, this is how we used to do it, this is how we'll always do it. No, you have to reinvent yourself, refocus and have more impact. So basically keep learning, keep, yes. keep hungry for more it knowledge. Is. Now, moving on to the gentleman right next to me, uh, Jeffrey Sajabi, basing on their submissions, we are seeing some companies have been lucky enough, really, to yeah. tell you stay at home and still pay you. But there are other people that have been laid off completely. For a young person watching us this morning that is worried that this could actually happen to them in the future, and you look at the theme this morning, preparing yourself for the versat current versatile job market, what would you say to them? Thank you. Um, what comes to mind is about adaptability, especially digital adaptability. So even when you've been laid off today, mm -hmm. uh, because when COVID came, companies were really hit so hard. And one of the easiest things to do was to cut costs. And, and, and so you look at your number of staff and say, perhaps if you guys can go home. But, but then people are beginning to realize again that with working from home, you can actually still employ so many people and they can work in the comfort of their homes. But also the trend is changing. Companies will no longer want you full time. Mm -hmm. So we don't need a staff that we, we're going to employ from Monday to Friday, mm -hmm. yeah? Or from Jan to December. A company might need you for just one week to come and offer a particular skill. Uh, and once you're done, you can move on to another uh, uh, company. So you no longer need to look at employment in the form of getting a job in this particular company, work for 40 years or 20 years and then retire and go home. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean means that now you need to be able to move on, on from company to company. You can actually work for more than one company at the same time. So if there is a problem at NSSF and we require a skill out there, you can actually get that opportunity, deliver whatever it is that um, we need within a week, then, then leave and go on to another job. So you no longer need to look at employment in form of having a place Permanent where you are stuck. Oh, yes. But what do you bring on the table? Mm. Um, we know that even as companies send people home, some of their issues still don't go away. So you can actually be in the comfort of your room 
and still work for so many companies. And the beauty is that um, you now cease to look at employment in terms of the local context. It's global. You can be in Ginger and you work in a company in UK. And again, you don't have to be their full-time employee. So yes. it's, it's more of the gigs now. So I can have as many gigs in a week. And, and these gigs may not be specific to a particular company. Mm. But I'm able to provide the solutions to different uh, uh, companies. So in essence, you've got to be able to be adaptable. You cannot work the traditional way. Sure. Being able to adapt seems to cut across uh, from our speaker's submissions. I do want to now to get back to Juliana. When you look at the current space that we're working in, you, you can almost tell that technology is taking over. For the young people this morning, what would you tell them the best way to use technology to stay relevant? Um, yes, uh, well, I'm doing it right now, aren't I? I am yes. using technology to stay relevant. I almost didn't make it for this expo, um, but because I'm so passionate about getting a message across to this new generation of um, probably um, employees, if they want, or entrepreneurs, um, I have now you know, uh, leveraged technology um, to stay relevant on this particular platform. I would say, and I said in my earlier submission, it is about um, moving with the digital transformation. Um, it must not happen to you, it must happen with you. So what are you doing in the space of upskilling yourself? Um, and we must, we must not leave um, digital um, transformation and digital technology to the, you know, to, to, to the ICT gurus or the technical um, uh, uh, geniuses in this space. I think that everybody um, across um, um, generations and you know, we have even old people now, you know, you saw the other day, I think parliamentarians were struggling to use their iPads. Um, you have to upskill yourself in this space. We're lucky because for Uganda, um, and you know, allow me to speak a few, uh, a little bit on, on the macro indicators of, of this country. We're lucky we have one of the youngest populations in the world. Um, that means that generally speaking, even um, our adaptability index to the earlier speaker's um, point is, tends to be higher than the rest of the world. Um, so we have a young blossoming generation of innovators or um, daredevils in some spaces. Um, there's really no reason why um, this generation of, uh, of, of upcoming professionals, uh, about one million Ugandans are entering the job market every year. So it just means uh, the competition is very high so if you do not have a competitive aid, the competitive advantage of knowing um, how to use um, digital technology to either propel yourself or your organization or even your business, uh, because you know a lot of Ugandans are entrepreneurs, um, I think you would be very disadvantaged. So for me, um, the key there is to just keep upskilling yourself, uh, keeping abreast um, with what's happening in the digital world and um, as a transformation across Africa the transformation wave sweeps across Africa is to sweep along with it um, rather than wait for it to come to you. Yes. Well, I will stay with you. For a, a younger person watching us this morning, they could be listening to you but really needing more clarity on what you mean by keeping yourself abreast with a digital technology. What exactly do yes. they, they could be having their smartphone or even a laptop. When you say they need to keep <laughs> up to date, what do you mean? Yes. Um, I mean exactly what um, it, it kind of uh, speaks for itself. We have to sharpen the saw. I will refer to a book I read a long time ago um, that uh, really changed my um, view of the world um, and my career in, in, in particular. Um, sharpening the saw, um, which was the seventh habit um, of um, highly effective people, a book written by Steve Covey. I highly recommend that book for young upcoming professionals in this space. So um, essentially his ideology is that there's seven habits um, for highly effective people. Um, and there, there are many, you know, this, you know, start with the end in mind, put first things first, um, seek to understand before you're understood. But the one I want to dwell on, which is the seventh habit, um, which speaks to sharpening the saw, upskilling yourself or preparing yourself or readying yourself um, uh, for this digital era really uh, um, is, is an aspect of reading, um, visualizing, and those who don't read, because this new generation doesn't like reading too much, 
Um, there's so much content, whether it's on the internet, whether it's on YouTube, in the space of learning. So you do not have to be in the traditional classroom to upskill yourself. You can as easily get online. Um, and, and you know, COVID, um, we said earlier, has presented us with a new opportunity to kind of reset. It's given us the time um, to start, um, whether it's researching um, around um, technology and what's up, upcoming in the space. If you are a um, desiring to go into farming, for example, how much uh, can digital, uh, the digital era help you to catapult um, your farming ambition? So all this um, uh, material is available. So there's the reading, but then there's also just um, seeking to understand from the people that have gone before you. I think the mistake or um, a lot of the things that set us back around thinking our problems or our issues are unique to ourselves. If you are curious enough, if you keep asking and wanting to learn and maybe unlearn, um, then you should be proactively seeking mentors, coaches, so um, gurus in the space. That's another way to upskill yourself. So for me, I would say reading, um, exposing yourself to the right literature, um, exposing yourself to the right um, visual stimulation, um, exposing yourself to the right people um, that can guide and lead and um, possibly impart um, you know, digital um, technology um, tricks of the trade, so to speak, to you. So um, it's, it's about learning um, and upskilling yourself, really, to prepare yourself for um, the digital transformation era. All right, uh, thank you so much, Juliana. I, I will pass this uh, follow-up uh, follow question to UCK. Upskilling seems to cut across when she's talking uh, in her submission. From your own experience, just to bring it in, is whose role is it? Is it the young people's role to... Mm look for opportunities to upskill or the university's role or the government's role, or all together? <laughs> I, I feel like that's a trick question. <laughs> we I'm believe that there could no, be other stakeholders watching us today. For not doing the right thing. Yes. I uh, won't fall for the trap. Mm. But, but really, I think, uh, and, and I hear where she's coming from, but I see myself in the young person yes. uh, who is listening, who is saying, you don't know my life. You know, I'm probably listening on this, on my mother's phone, on a neighbor's phone, um, who probably doesn't even have an opportunity uh, to, um, to, 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 to have a data bundle to listen, mm -hmm. to research, to read, to do anything. And, and that's the biggest percentage, you know, of, uh, of, 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 of this country. You know, access to technology, access to all of these platforms. People who are facing real, problems, you know, of, I don't even have lunch, you know, how can I be getting ahead? Uh, and there's a big segment of, of, of those, you know, young people out there, some of them might be listening. And, and I think for me, the tra one of the tragedies of uh, the generation we're facing is by continuously calling people young, you know, say young people, young people, you find a 25 year old person who's a young person. You know, that 28 young person, 20 young person. And what that means, or the reason I'm calling it a tragedy, is we begin to divorce. I think even the president was on saying, you know, you, you can't be a youth at 35 or 40. Mm. We begin to divorce the responsibility of changing our own lives to someone else. Because now you be, get annoyed because someone hasn't done for you you know, what you think they should do for you, you know, uh, and, and that's a big, big, big tragedy. Um, we need to begin inspiring this generation, these young people, young, and I emphasizing young, to, to take charge, you know, to take charge. Of How the, do they take yes, charge? Take charge of the life you want to live, mm -hmm. take charge of the results you want to uh, achieve, Take charge of the future you want uh, to to see. So there are basic principles of taking charge, um, and you know we have big dreams. You know I know you have you know big audacious dreams. Um, it's very important to know that you are going to have to be responsible for the biggest percentage, if not all, of the things that you want. Everybody else is around to support you. They can only 
really support you if you're in charge and you know and you know who to go to for what you want. Take charge, you know, stop the expectation of what government can do, what the university can do, what do you really want to achieve. Um, and then once you've taken charge, you know, you know it's not going to happen tomorrow. You know, things do take time. Uh, in my own career, it took, I, I, I remember when I was looking for a corporate job, I had to apply for 80 jobs before I got my first job. You know, eight zero. We, we went to, the closest I came to a corporate job, we went to Nambole, uh, up to test, 50 questions, 50 minutes. The questions they say, you know, a mango has fallen from the tree, it rolls, it stopped rolling. Which direction is it facing? How am I supposed to know? So I didn't get the job, right? But I realized that even when I grew my career into consulting, even when I grew my career into a dream corporate job where you have uh, uh, business class flight tickets and everything taken care of you, um, you, you're not fulfilled if you're not doing something you love to do. And all of us love to do something. All of us have a gift. All of us have an aspiration. All of us want to contribute. So the take charge really is, for me, level one. Stop expecting anyone to do you any favors. Stop uh, getting annoyed at people for what they didn't do for you, what they said about you, what you think they should be doing for you, and then look in the mirror and then begin to face the reality mm. of who's this guy, uh, why am I here, what do I want to contribute, what change do I want to give. That's where a popular you know, uh, says, you know, um, don't ask what your country can do for you. Instead, ask what you can do for your country. So for me, when I look at the young person, it's more around, OK, you expect all of these things to be done for you, but what are you going to do for, for your country, for your community? Uh, and, and that's where we speak about solving problems, becoming an entrepreneur, um, partnering with other people. Don't go at it alone. It's such a painful journey. Yes. Find someone you can work with. Find someone who has already solved something that you're interested in, uh, and then take advantage of all the opportunities that are available. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can guarantee that right now, in this time, there are more opportunities than there were before. Right? But then we, we just need to take charge, ownership of what we want to achieve. We need to be responsible yes. for our own lives. And accountable. Yes. <laughs> Barbara Arimi. Yes, please. I like, um, I, I like the way you've put it, and I am actually also learning from you the aspect of expectations and taking charge. But I just wanted to add to the opportunities that are presented by technology. I know that uh, there is a percentage of Ugandans that don't have access to technology, but I want to focus on, for now, I believe those who are online have access to technology. So I see uh, the opportunities, uh, basically there are three key opportunities I see. The first is an opportunity for building your personal brand. What is that that you stand for? And I, I sometimes see um, people misusing this opportunity and instead destroying their personal brands. Remember that you're leaving a footprint on digital. So you have all these social media accounts mm. and you, you find, um, people posting very uh, inappropriate content. Because think about yourself, where are you going to be 10 years from now? Yeah, are you going to be a successful person? And what do you want to associate with? So when you create a social media page, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's uh, Facebook, whether it's Twitter, you know, post things that build your personal brand. If you are a designer, like you said, post things about design. If you're a motivational speaker, create content that builds you and positions you, you know, and all this is free. Position yourself so that people, when they, they type in such pages and, and click and say motivational speakers, you pop up because you're creating content that is relevant for that. Yes. As opposed to just creating content about uh, things that are happening in your life that are not relevant. Remember, you don't have a show like Keeping Up With The Kardashians or something. <laughs> So why is it that you're posting and saying, I'm now eating fish? Or, um, you know, things that, 
So how is that going to help you later on? <laughs> you could be marketing a restaurant. <laughs> you have to be deliberate. <laughs> That is the first thing that I see with technology and yes. uh, the opportunities that are within there. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is I see technology as an opportunity for service delivery. And, and let's say you have something that you are selling. You could, you could have a skill. You could be actually an artist. Maybe you, you actually are good at drawing something. You could have a skill in gardening. You could have a skill you know, in baking, you know, and this is your side hustle. Like personally, I actually bake cakes. I, I also sing sometimes. So I have side hustles. <laughs> so as opposed to using, I, I also do clothing actually. So as opposed to using the technology just for free, you can use it actually to sell your stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, take pictures of your things, put them on your status, you know, uh, share with your friends, create a name, all your thing, mango, ginger, something, you know, and position it, you know, like this is where fashion comes to life or where you can get all the fru fruit, fruits delivered for free, you know, something of the sort, and use this actually to sell what you have. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, and this is the benefit that has come with technology, that content is being created by everyone. Everyone has a right to become an authority in something. So that is a space that you can exploit, become an authority in something. You could even become an authority. I see so many people doing, you know, exercise uh, tips, beauty tips. If you love beauty, you could actually start a beauty page, give people advice, and in the process, you can even start selling merchandise that is related to beauty without even producing this merchandise yourself. So that is really how I see the opportunities presented within uh, technology. We'll be getting back to the topic of technology because I think it's yeah. a broad aspect that young people today need to understand how to exploit. But I still want us to understand whose role it is to upskill. Yeah. Because young people generally, because I, I am a young person and I have interacted with young people, yes. we have this sense, like Sika mentioned, of we are so entitled. Yes. And I, a student, a young girl, a young boy at this point should be able to understand that it is their role. But I want it to come from you. Whose oh, role yes. is it yes. to upskill yourself? That is a question I, I love. Actually, I thought he had done a very good job at yes. answering it. Of course, it's my role to upskill. Mm. And it starts with an awareness of who I am. What are my uh, like key strengths? You know, um, and I'll just take it from, you know, okay, personal example. While I was growing up, uh, my mother, of course, uh, was a banker and she thought, okay, you need to do accounting. But then I realized it wasn't coming naturally to me. So I decided, no, I need to do marketing. So I took it upon myself as after my first degree to actually do, uh, to study more around marketing, you know. so. Because of that, then it helped position me for the job market. So the first responsibility is yours to really understand what are you built for, what is coming naturally to you. You know, fine, you could be in a family of doctors, but then you realize that for you, you're not really interested in medicine. Perhaps you're interested in business. So then you need to ask yourself, if I'm interested in business, what skills does a business person need? perhaps things like financial management. And then you actually take a step forward. You know, you don't need to be in a classroom to learn. That is a mistake we make. You can learn from books. You could get some books, read them, or you could actually learn from peers. Or you could volunteer somewhere. You could see uh, maybe a, a small business somewhere, and then you volunteer and say, I want to learn from you. You know, everyone here has a social network, mm. relatives, families, friends, church, you know, find a place where you can volunteer in your social network and then learn that skill, you know, practice it. Also, there are so many uh, online free courses online. Someone could take advantage of that. So I honestly know that for sure it's not the responsibility of your parent. Of your parents government. have done enough. Are you, I'm sure you've had government to Yambi. Exactly. Yes. Government. It, it's not government has done what they could do. Free a primary, free edu secondary education. But now the onus is on you. What can you do after government has done something, your parent has done something, you're finalizing your degree, what else can you do for yourself? It's your responsibility. And, and uh, I know it's hard to take that in,
but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do it for, for yourself, I always tease um, some of the, people, the young people that I talk to. I tell them there's no angel that is coming to brush your teeth here. As in, you wake up in the morning and you have to take hold of your life yeah. and do something with it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Barbara. Let's speak the thoughts of jo Geoffrey Sajabi. You, you, you may find he could have a different opinion. What I are your think thoughts? it's government's role. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on whose role it is for the young people to upskill them, themselves? Or is it some other person's role to help out? Thank you, Sandra. Uh, on a lighter note, first of all, I, I'm, I'm glad knowing that Barbara thinks she can sing. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll be talking about that I'll later. List you as a backup. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, I can actually be your backup, but I don't need to be in the video. And Sike will be the manager. So, so now going back <laughs> to the issue of whose responsibility it is. Yes. There is no doubt that, of course, the government, the university, the parents have got a part to play. Mm. But, but, but that said, ultimately, the responsibility lies on the individual. I'll, I'll give an example of the border border guys. So a few years back, um, we see safe border here, okay? Now, they are dealing with many fellows that have not even been to a classroom, mm -hmm. but then they've got to use a phone, and they've got to get their customers through that phone. This border border guy has never been to a school to teach them digital stuff, never. But then they are signed up, they've got to buy that phone, not even Safe Border buys them that phone. Not even the government buys them that phone. They've got to have data on that phone for them to be able to get the customers. But above all, they've got to teach themselves how to use the tools. Because if you don't, then you don't get the customers. So if you're speaking of a context where a guy that has not been to school before, mm -hmm. you can get your phone right now, and many border guys will actually be out there to give you the right that you need. Now. I, I don't think it was a responsibility of the government to actually teach them that. Mm -hmm. Government has, of course, a duty. Are the roads, you know, uh, uh, functional? Okay. So if I'm riding my bike on the road, is it actually safe? So ultimately, the biggest work is to be done by the individual. You've got to look for opportunities out there that enable you to learn. And 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 I mean, if you sit and wait for your parent, if you sit and wait for government. It's not going to happen. Mm. Let's look at the universities. When, when COVID came, we've seen many of the universities now also go online. We know that many exams in the past, I, I think around December, were done online. Many of the universities even today are teaching online. So I think that already they've been able to demonstrate the fact that if we're teaching online, if we're examining you online, Already it means you need to have the skill to be able to take that exam mm. online. So in that regard, you'd say that the university has already done its part, okay? Because if they examine you, if they teach you online, it means they have also been able to realize they need to adapt and do it very fast. And, and, and it would mean that all the schools out there perhaps now need also to go online. I mean, if if... If the young person who is listening in today is thinking that they will get their job um, application and take to a physical address in a building in town, it's not going to happen. Chances are you're going to apply for that job online. You're going to sit for the interviews online. Okay, So you've got to be able to teach yourself the skills that you require to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. And again, like we said earlier, you're not even going to be looking for jobs in your town. Yes. You're going to be looking for jobs globally. Mm -hmm. So the entire world is in, on your fingertips. But then the people that are digitally agile will be the ones who are able to take advantage of the opportunities. And, 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 and so you can't afford to sit out there and wait for the government and wait for your father, really. All so right. it is your duty. It is your duty. It was very deliberate to have all the speakers say that so that you who's watching us today, you know, starting today, do something that is going to push you ahead. Start taking up that course. Go to YouTube. Find information that you think will help you become a better person. 
if there's anything that has come out clearly from this is that technology is very key when you're preparing yourself for this changing environment. And I do want to turn to Juliana. We want to pick your thoughts on some of the common mistakes. Barbara pointed out some of your eating fish. What use is that? But like I said, someone could be marketing a restaurant or something. Juliana, what are some of the mistakes that you think young people make while using technology? Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, I, just a question, um, are, are we able to also answer some of the questions on um, coming through the chat, or yes, is that another yes. session? Because I have the advantage, obviously, of being um, on the Zoom um, link, and therefore I'm seeing a lot of questions in, in real time, and it's uh, very exciting questions that are, I think, uh, very provocative. Uh, somebody, for example, has asked, I have one million shillings, um, do I upskill or do I start a business? That one right. I, I will give it to the Innovation Hub manager. <laughs> Juliana, we'll be oh, able yeah, so to have a section where, a, a part where we'll be talking, yes. looking at the questions uh, later on. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Because um, they, they, they're actually very, um, I think they, they're helping build the conversation. Um, so anyway, back to your uh, question around, um, again, digital transformation. Um, and, and, you know, what are the mistakes that we're making? Barbara gave a very good one of, you know, um, uh, really wasting time on there rather than using um, the technology to advance our personal brands um, and upskill ourselves um, back to that question. I think for me also, um, some of the uh, mistakes we're making are not just in the digital um, space of things. Um, an earlier speaker alluded to the fact that, you know, only a small percentage of um, our population, especially the young one, is actually online mm -hmm. or has access to the internet. I'd rather speak to the questions that we're making generally um, in building our careers and, and seeking these jobs. I think a lot of times we're expecting very fast results. And it could be because we're looking at the people who have gone ahead of us. When you look at the successful Barbara, you, you look at you know um, all these great panelists, um, they didn't get there in two seconds. Um, and so I think for me, the lack of discipline or staying um, or on course uh, with your agenda is what is plaguing um, a lot of us and, and a lot of Ugandans right now. So the expectation of fast results and um, shortcuts, so to speak. So it goes back to who is responsible um, for getting you ahead, who is responsible for getting you into the boardroom with the right um, people. So I, I think for me, that is one area where, you know, um, young people are moving on a certain um, tangent or are uh, using um, other people's velocity to gauge their own personal velocity. Um, I think also, um, and if you will indulge me, I'd like to speak a little bit about, um, um, you know, the fear of failure or getting stuck on mistakes or dwelling on errors we've made in the past. Um, if you have indeed uh, posted, um, been posting information um, or putting out um, uh, personal um, data that's not really building yourself, rather than getting stuck on those mistakes or um, getting scared of failure or now withdrawing completely, um, why not, again, back to our theme, repurpose um, yourself or repurpose um, your output um, on, on the digital um, platforms. So I think for me, we have to purpose um, to desire success more than we fear failure. So back to the old adage, you know, um, try and fail, but don't fail to try um, type of thing. So, um, I mean, all the previous speakers have talked about reading in order to upskill yourself, even if you don't have access to technology. Um, they're still physical books. People, some of us are still reading physical books. Uh, so um, you can also upskill yourself in that space. But I think one we've not talked very much, much on, and I'd like us maybe um, also to touch on, is around mentorship and um, the opportunity around upskilling yourself through um, proactively seeking coaches and those who have gone ahead of you. Um, and then I think that's where you start to unpack that actually these results or success does not happen overnight. Um, yeah, so I think for me, mentors and proactively seeking, uh, to the point where you're banging on the doors of MDs who mm. don't know your name, um, you need to be almost unabashed, shamelessly um, desiring that success more than you fear failure. Um, I, I, I humbly submit. All right. <laughs> to you, moderator. 
Okay, thank you so much. Now, uh, the main reason as to why I'm looking at the common mistakes, because when you're preparing to get into the job space, all of us here could be looking for an employer, uh, an employee. What are uh, some of the mistakes that they make that you think you will see online and you will actually not take them on? We are speaking to university students that are going to step out sooner or later and will be looking for job opportunities. Barbara, if you are hiring someone today and you check them out online, what are some of those things that uh, you would say, mm -mm, I'm not taking this one? Um, of course, uh, the key thing about being online and how you behave is you're communicating. As a person, you, you can either communicate uh, you know, from the way you position yourself, your looks, your pictures. You can also communicate verbally or in written format. So now, I can see your communication online and just understand your attitude towards life. You know, the pictures that you take and the way you're standing and everything can point out some traits about you. And also the, the kind of responses that you're giving online, you know, where, when, when people engage you in conversation can also tell something about you. So, so really it's, it's very easy to see someone's attitude. And I think your attitude in life is very important. How you see yourself. You know, you, you need to ask yourself, what am I on this earth for? What am I doing here? What difference can I make in this life, in my generation, in my workplace, in my family? So when you get that right, when you understand your purpose, then you'll have the right attitude. Because at some point, you need to tell yourself, this is beneath me. I am going to be possibly uh, the next vice president of this country, and how am I supposed to position myself? So your attitude, and that also trickles in when you go for an interview. You need to have value. When someone asks you, okay, you, you just, you, the way you respond, uh, I'm just uh, hoping that maybe you can pay this amount of money. And then you, I've interviewed people who come and tell you about the mishaps in their lives, you know. I, you know, kind of like a pity party. And yet, this is an opportunity for you to sell yourself. Usually, when people call for an interview, they are giving you an opportunity. And it's an equal platform. So, if you come for that interview, your attitude, you know, tell yourself, I'm going to make sure that these people see what I have. The skills that I have, the competences that I have, the uniqueness that I have as an individual and where I'm going in life. And um, I think CK mentioned about like your, your personal like, skills and competences. So if you know yourself and you align yourself to the job, you cannot be everything to everyone. You cannot do everything. You, you can't be looking for a job and someone meets you and they ask and say, okay, what kind of job? You're like, anything will do. No, that's a risk. Actually, the first thing is I can't take such a person. If you're asking them, what do you want? Anything will do. That is a big risk. You need to know what you want in life. And you need to have the right attitude. You also need to believe in yourself. Because no one knows you the way you know yourself. Believe in yourself. There is no single person who has been created without a uniqueness, without a unique talent. Everyone is unique, and every single person has something to offer. So. Honestly, you just have to believe in yourself, have the right attitude, and stop making the mistakes you know, of being everything online to everyone. Focus, build your brand, and you will really make it in life. And, and again, another thing, it's not about how much resources you have. Mm. You know, some people think that maybe when I become the, the MD, then I will show these people what stuff I'm made of. Mm. Or when I become, when I get a uh, hundred million, then I'll do this. You have to start with what you have. Start little. If you want to be an MD, your attitude from the first day you get into that organization should show. Don't engage in small talk. Be results oriented. Engage people. Converse with them. Network. And as you network, you build your social capital. As you deliver your results, you build your intellectual capital. And then you, that's how people go up the ranks, you see. Eh? And don't wait for that 100 million and say, that's when I'll start my fashion business. 
<laughs> that's where you are. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, this is a question I'm going to pose to the gents. It is said that you have 10 minutes to prepare uh, and uh, to do something. If you're given 10 minutes to do something, you have about eight to even nine to prepare and one minute to take action. What are some of those key preparation tips that you would give young people watching us today as they prepare to get ahead? How do they pre position themselves in such a way that when they're in front, like Barbara said, you don't do this and the other, but we want to hear from you. You have 10 minutes to do something, eight, nine minutes to prepare, and one minute to take action. Thank you, Sandra. And I'm going to answer that a bit in context of um, digital. Yes. Uh, just like to follow up what she was um, saying. So you've got to be original, yeah? There are times when you read stuff online and you can immediately tell that this is not your actual um, ideas. You, you don't even bother to acknowledge the fact that you're not the author. So even by just going online, I can easily tell that the stuff that you perhaps uh, put forward don't even belong to you. So at worst, at least, um, you need to acknowledge. So, so just being authentic, being original, yeah, would, would basically be able to put you much ahead, yeah. But also, like you say, that the biggest amount of time is not spent on, say, the actual job, but being able to prepare to uh, get there. Again, talking in context of the environment now, yeah, like I said earlier, you're going to be invited for an interview. And that interview is not going to be in a boardroom. It's going to be online. Are you even able to attend an online um, um, interview when you are called? I recall some few weeks back we had an advert that you know um, went out and people applied. Now, um, people were invited back through email, right? And some candidates you know, came up and said they they, they had, I think, spent a week without reading their emails. By the time they read the emails, the interviews had been done, and perhaps people were already being called to come and take up jobs. So even, even simple stuff like being able to check your emails, okay, because then you know that communication is going to be through, um, um, you know, mail. So, so you need to ensure that you are able to check your emails all the time, okay, if you've applied for a job and you sent your application via email, sometimes you, you just need to check um, um, the online to be able to, to figure out what stage is the job now. Have they done interviews? Have they called guys? But then if you're not um, up to speed, interviews can be done and you, you're actually still waiting to be um, called. So young people need to be up to speed. Young people need to be updated. But also just the fact of um, um, reading. You need to read. You need to read as much as you possibly can. And I think the difference now is that in the past, reading meant that you've got to buy a newspaper maybe every day. And you can say, I cannot afford a newspaper. Maybe you need to go to a library and buy a book. And perhaps you cannot afford uh, a book. But you've got a phone. And there is so much information that is available online. You can even verify some of the sources and they are authentic, and you can as well do a lot of reading. Uh, now just uh, for you, CK, entrepreneurship seems to come at cost. Uh, for the young people watching us today, oh, uh, sorry again. Entrepreneurship it seems to be a topic everyone wants to engage in. Would you advise young people to have two options, get the job and also have a side hustle? It's a nice question, another trick question. But uh, I'd like to speak also, just uh, if I could go back a little bit to the, the preparation. Yes. Because um, my previous life was a recruiter. Now my number one day job is to look for talent, mm -hmm. you know, people who want to work. And when I say work, I mean work, 26 hours a day. So I think you, you, you build your profile online, mm -hmm. such that when someone meets Sandra, they're able to understand who Sandra is. And when I was a recruiter, we used to look at three things. Um, who is Sandra? You know, can I look at the profile that you've built online? Um, 
and, and, and try to get a sense of who Sandra is. You know? And then the second thing is, you know, can Sandra do the job? You know, so what content are you going to share online that will give uh, the confidence that by working with Sandra, uh, they, can, they can do the job? You know? And then the last question uh, that we look out for is, can we live with Sandra? You know, I mean, best off again what content she's creating and putting out there. Are we going to be fighting every day, or uh, are you able to judge from the attitude that you know she's a, a warm, you know, opinionated, you know, type person? So it's very important to communicate uh, the, through the profile you have online, especially in relation to what you need or what 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 you want. So when it comes to entrepreneurship. I, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. You know, I tell people, if you haven't started a business or you haven't become an entrepreneur, don't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Uh, your, your, uh, your, your tolerance for pain must be uh, high, you know, because 95% of all businesses fail in the US and European markets, 98% fail, even where they have the capital. So entrepreneurship is not an option because I can't get a job. That's the mistake we make. And entrepreneurship is also not uh, something you do and then do something else uh, on, on the side, especially if you want to uh, do it at scale and you know, be able to benefit from the value of, of doing it. Entrepreneurship is... is uh, so I say, if you haven't started a business, don't start. If you've started, sorry for you, um, you have to go through the basics. There are no shortcuts. You know, uh, put in the time, mm -hmm. uh, understand what you want, understand who can help you to get what you want, uh, and deliver real value. Most of the time when I'm speaking to entrepreneurs, they say, but I don't have the capital to do X. Uh, and then I normally respond that, you know, capital doesn't follow those who need it. In fact, it runs away from them. Capital follows those who are creating value for it. So the more value, the more problems, the more contribution you're able to make, the more the capital, the resources will come to you. And we also have another concept that we call OPM. So the, the, I think the best part about entrepreneurship is that you don't even have to use your resources. You know, you have, we say OPM, so you can use other people's money, other people's management, other people's marketing. Mm -hmm. You can come and convince Barbara here that if you partner with my business and give me $100,000, this is how it's going to help you. So you also need to know what value you're creating for Barbara before you tap into uh, management, marketing, mm -hmm. and money. But um, I think the opportunity is Uganda is really entrepreneurial. Everybody has a side hustle. Everybody is trying to do something. Everybody wants to solve a problem. The key gap is that we are making that the side business instead of the main business. The main business of building businesses that are able to employ other young people, solve problems, and you know we all know there are not enough jobs. So for me, and that's our mission, to make sure that you know, if you are an entrepreneur, that if you've decided to do business, we're able to support you to get the access to capital, access to partners, access to you know, the right policy environment to be able to help you uh, succeed and build this country. All right, uh, thank you so much, CK. So for those that haven't started businesses, shouldn't. I would like you to <laughs> clarify on that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's that, um, it's, it's hard, mm. you know. They should know that. Yeah, the, the, you should know that. Go into it knowing that it doesn't do you any favors. And the, if you th still think, again, you're young, then you're, 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 it's even worse. Because it's being like locked into a room with a lion, and because you're young, the lion won't eat you, it will tear you into pieces, regardless of your age. So it's hard, but it's not impossible. Mm. Right now, like I said, there are many more opportunities than there have ever been. If you look at just the incubators, entrepreneurial support organizations, the grants, I know NSSF is also going to launch a, a program supporting innovators. There are so many opportunities. 
but then we miss out on uh, them because we are not ready. Uh, you don't have a value proposition that's investable. We miss out on them because we believe we deserve them, mm -hmm. such that it's NSSF's responsibility to, to, identify to, to, me. To, to, I, to give me what I think I need to build the business. Mm -hmm. uh, we miss out because we divorce that responsibility. So it's hard, but it's not impossible. All right. Yes, please. Over to you, Jeffrey. Um, perhaps just to add on the issue of the side hustle. Mm. I, I, I think at some point you've also got to make a decision. We've also seen in the workplace so many examples of young people who get this opportunity, but because they've been groomed to the extent that you've got to have a side hustle besides your job, many times you do none of the two things well. So at some point, you've done so poor at your job that you've lost your job, but because you had your job, you also did so poor at your side hustle. So you get to a point where your side hustle is normal, but also your main job is actually uh, uh, normal. So except until when you get to a point where you have the ability to balance both, mm -hmm. you are likely to be in a dilemma where you're ineffective at your actual job, which in most cases is what is giving you the resources to begin that side hustle. Side hustle. But also if your side hustle is in such a way that you've got to run it yourself, then what time do you have for your main job? So even when it is true that um, Ugandans tend to start businesses you know, so much, perhaps part of the failure is explained by the fact that many of the guys who begin those businesses are also in a main job. So they're trying to balance what they're doing at their main job, but they also need to make their side hustle work. So even when it's okay to have that side hustle, it's got to be done in such a way that it, it doesn't compromise your ability to deliver effectively on your job, but at the same time, you can also be able to deliver on that side hustle. Are you doing it in such a way that you don't have to run it yourself mm -hmm. so it can actually be able to run even without you? Unfortunately, for most people, they begin types of hustles that require your full-time attention while at the same time you've got to do a job. Mm -hmm. So there should be a moment, a time, when you've got to make a distinction and you've got to make a choice. So can I focus entirely on my job and achieve my goals in my job? Or am I done with this job so I can full-time focus on the side hustle? Because if you open a business that you've got to run yourself, then what time are you going to have to do your other job? Mm -hmm. So perhaps there should be a moment when you make that choice. Create a balance. Sure. In the shop. Mm -hmm. And of course, their work is to be in the shop and then sell the items. And you already have a social network. So you just let the social network know that this facility is available. So you, you need to split the roles and ask yourself, OK, in terms of the actual day-to-day -day running, uh, who is going to do this? In terms of marketing, who is going to do that? In terms of uh, logistics, who is going to do that? I think I personally come from a different school of thought. I think a side hustle can work if you have a structure in place. And this talks to the Ugandan businesses. And this is, I think, the reason why most businesses don't survive after the person who has created it, because there's no governance structure in place. Mm -hmm. There should be a governance structure for every business, whether it's a small one or it's a big one. And it starts small. Start small. Make sure that your business has a structure that is supporting it. If you have a talent, let's say, for example, photography, you can start a studio. You get a studio in place, get a couple of photographers, tell them, we have, we have this business. You, you'll find that you don't have to be there at any one point. Your other friend could go, you could go, you see. And then you find that actually, you're multiplying. Or if I decided to partner with someone who is into photography, I'll just say, okay, fine, what equipment do we need? They tell me maybe we need uh, this kind of camera, this kind of videos. What is the startup capital? 20 million. Okay, then we say, fine, what is the shareholding? Uh, maybe, okay, so this person is going to be there physically, so we are going to make sure that we also ensure that we equate that into share capital for them. 
and then maybe another two, three people raise capital, and then there are also shareholders, and then we balance. So this person is doing the management, there's a target, and you're supporting in terms of capital, and the business is running, so at the end of the day, after a year has gone monthly, you have reports, you have auditing, uh, someone checks the sales and everything, and you can actually be able to say, okay, the, we, we made, uh, let's say, I realize actually there's a lot of money now in photography and, and videography. Mm -hmm. On a daily, someone could make maybe one million shillings. So in a month, that is 30 million, if they are busy. So if it's a, if it's a year, <laughs> if it's a year, I, I'm calculating some people's businesses here. Yeah. That's a minimum of 150 million mm. on the lower side. And remember, maybe you are actually the shareholders. You've agreed on a salary. So you see, I personally think that it's maybe our approach to the business that is stopping us. Because you find someone like Trump has so many businesses and he's not there, but he has a structure in place. You know, if you have a structure to deliver, the challenge we have is if I'm good at something, then I want to do it all the time and do it alone. Then I get overwhelmed doing it. And then I can't actually multiply myself. If you read that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the guy t talks about how do you multiply yourself through several people? And that is the art of shareholding. Come together, pool capital, start a business, have clear targets, clear structures, how you can measure, and then you can actually benefit from a side hustle. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you so much, Juliana, CK, and Geoffrey. We are getting into the, the part where we let you ask as many questions as you want to our speakers. So you should be ready. These young people have very interesting questions. So get yourselves ready. But before we do that, we remind you that every single day we have lots of goodies to give away. All you have to do is respond to our quiz question of the day. Taking you back to day one, we asked you what was the key highlight of the session. Day two, what was the key highlight of the session? Of course, earlier we had asked the speakers of the next day before today. So all those different answers, if you can send us your responses, your answers, we'll be right there to select you and you win lots and lots of goodies. Remember to use the hashtag NSSF Expo 2021. Now, throughout this whole session, we've been ask, reminding you this entire expo, we've been reminding you to register and become an, S an NSSF member. And today we are privileged to have Geoffrey Sajabi to expound on why it is important for young people to, have, to become NSSF members. I'm giving you two minutes. I hope that's enough. And, NSSF and is too important to yes. be told in two minutes, but I'll try. <laughs> so, so it is important to become member of the fund because then you have an opportunity to begin saving at an early age. And, and perhaps just to emphasize, the money that you send to NSSF is not just a saving, it is an investment. Because whatever money you save with the fund, this money is invested and you get a return on your money every financial year. So, so NSSF is beyond simply saving. NSSF is an active investment. And uh, the irony or the dilemma of the country is that uh, the greatest percentage of people that are employed have only NSSF, okay? So if this is the only saving that perhaps you, you're going to have, it's important that you register with the fund. And the biggest advantage is uh, that for every one shilling you save with NSSF, your employer saves twice. So if you save 5%, your employer is topping that up by 10%. And um, because the investments are done on, on a, a basis of compound interest, you're able to get from the fact that even the interest that you keep earning also eventually earns interest. So over the longer time, the money that you keep with NSSF is able to create wealth uh, uh, for you, is able to um, multiply. So it's not the same as keeping money perhaps on a bank um, 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 account, especially where it's not fixed, um, it won't earn you any money. What comes to NSSF is invested, and you get a return on it every financial. So we do encourage young people out there to actively register with the fund. There's also an opportunity for voluntary um, uh, members. So you don't need to have gotten a formal job anywhere. Even if you're doing your side hustle, and that's your main thing, you can still come to NSSF. We register you and support you to grow your savings that are being invested at the same time. Um, we've made registration so convenient and so easy. You register, 
online. So you visit the website of the fund, you follow the link, and you're able to register electronically. We've also got an app that you can actually be able to access, NSSF Go app, so you can um, download that app, and through that app, you can be able to register anytime, anywhere. Mm -hmm. You don't need to visit any of the branches of the fund. Mm -hmm. So basically, what we, we've been talking about earlier, NSSF is highly digital. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to visit the branch. You can be able to register through the app. You can be able to make your contributions via the app. Okay, and you can even be able to claim your money via the app. So basically, electronic out there. Everything has been made exactly. easy. Exactly. All right, thank you so much. Let us now dive into the questions. This is Marvin uh, DeBanch who says that, uh, uh, from DeBanch, Marvin, to all the panelists, I am a second year Macquarie University student. I'm currently requesting on some guidance. If I have a million shillings, I have two choices, to upskill or to start a small business. What should I choose? Juliana, if you're still with us, this is to you. Yes, um, please indulge me and repeat that question. Thank you. Okay, we have a one Marvin DeBanch from uh, Macquarie University, and he's saying yes. that if he has a million shillings, he has two choices, yes. to upskill or start a small business. He's wondering what would yes. he choose or what should he choose? That's the very question that I thought CK would be best placed to answer, if you remember correctly. <laughs> so I'm deferring that question to the entrepreneurship guru. Okay. Uh, it has been passed over to you, CK. It's a, it's a nice question. I don't know if I'm a guru, but uh, it's, it's a nice question. So the thing is, the thing is this. Um, whether you're going for skilling, you'll need more than a million. Whether you're going to start a business, you'll need more than a million. If you are going to skill you still, if you're going to build a business, skilling is your full-time job, upskilling. You know, what are you learning? What do you need to learn? What do you need to... So it's not either or, and investing it in either is not going to make you better off necessarily. Um, and I think this goes back to very closely to, you know, where you are and what you need to do and where you want to go. Um, there is a lot of knowledge you can find you know, online uh, about where you are, lots of knowledge. And even if you think you have come up with an original business idea that no one has started, mentioned, uh, and s someone told me, I'm, I'm sure you have never heard of this idea, and it has never been done in Sub-Saharan, and it's, it, uh, you know, it's a brilliant idea. And then when we Googled, we found that someone else was already doing it. So don't look at the one million as a means to skill, or as a means to uh, uh, to the business. Look at it rather as I have, this is the minimum resource I have now. What's the best use for it? And that's a question only you can answer. What's the best use for it for me to be able to move to the next level? Um, but either way, skilling, business, they're intertwined, and you have to do both. Um, so I, I guess just go back to where you are and uh, what's the best use of that resource. Mm. But uh, one thing I'm confident about, there's nothing new under the sun. Anything you want to find, you know, you'll find, you know, online. And if you use that little resource, again, to what you can easily find, uh, then you, you find that you're putting yourself in a, in a, in a more difficult position. So I'm not going to give the answer. It's, uh, it's best. I, I think my advice is use, the, use it to move to the next level. Mm -hmm. If it's the skill that will move you to the next level, then do that. If it's the business, then do that. But then um, I know there's so much knowledge out there already that can help you, uh, that you don't have to pay for. Be able to yeah. All right, uh, Marvin, I do hope that uh, CK has answered your question the way you would have wanted him to answer it. And uh, Jigen, I'm still with you because uh, the next question is for you. Uh, Vicky Navale says that how best can I sell myself to a potential employer so that they believe in my abilities without them looking at my education because it is not good grades. <laughs> Over to you, Juliana. Uh, the 
that's a great question again. Um, and that one I think I'm well placed as I've done a hundred or so interviews in my career. Um, I think for me, um, Barbara also alluded to it, um, it starts with your attitude. Typically, employers are looking for four, um, four main aspects of a potential employee. So one of the key um, um, indicators of whether you know, you're a perfect job fit or not is your attitude. And that can be read from immediately from how you present yourself in the interview. And sometimes it's as basic as your body language. It's as basic as how you have dressed, your level of preparation. And that, um, of course, is also seen from the kind of conversations you're having within that room. Always give context. Um, you should have researched very well on your potential employer. Um, so that even your conversation, every time you ask a question, you bring it back to the reality or the context in which um, the organization or the company you're joining is playing. So all that speaks to attitude. Your level of preparation um, can easily be gauged from the kind of examples you give in that room, um, from just how much you've researched um, on the company. So attitude is one. Um, I think for me, um, also interpersonal uh, skill can be gauged uh, from your from the first interaction you have with your potential employer. So interpersonal skill, um, you know, comes with communication, your ability to negotiate in that room. Um, again, an example was given earlier of, you know, um, what do you want to do? What do you see yourself doing in the next? Time? Anything as long as you pay me is fine. Um, it already speaks to um, your own view of yourself or how much you value. Um, what you're bringing to the table. So interpersonal skill set, listening, active listening. Um, again, that can be demonstrated through your body language. Um, are you keeping eye contact with your interviewer? That is also very key. Um, unfortunately for us, a lot of times Ugandans, we are, um, in, as we're being brought up, um, a sign of humility is looking down. Or don't uh, know that I'm You know, your mother is just telling you, just look away. That shows that you're humble. Unfortunately, that doesn't work in the boardroom, um, and keeping and maintaining eye contact um, is a sign of confidence, is a sign of um, really great interpersonal skill set. Um, so listening actively, learning the names of your interview, uh, interviewing panel, um, all that speaks to your interpersonal know-how. So there's attitude, there's interpersonal skill set, and then there's the technological know-how. So again, being really well versed with the subject matter or the job that you're interviewing for, um, your knowledge on on um, or the company on on um, their organizational uh, values, um, you know, you should have by that time talked to one or two um, current employees in there um, in order to demonstrate just how um, keen you are to join that um, organization. Um, yeah, so technical know-how, and then, um, of course, experience. Now, of course, everybody here, about 200 pan, um, inter attendees, do not have um, experience because you're just coming into possibly your first job or so. But experience is um, a very vast word. So experience could be, um, you know, you uh, interned um, at one or two um, organizations before you joined this one. That's also experience, even if it was an unpaid job. So do not take experience to mean I have worked, um, had a consistent job for two or three years. This is the experience that I'm bringing to the table. Experience could be as menial as um, used to moonlight at your judge's uh, chicken farm during the holidays, in your S4 VAC, in your S6 VAC. That is experience. Um, you have been in charge of um, uh, delivering a small project at school. That is experience. You led a team of um, you know, one or two um, uh, discussants um, in a debate at school. That is experience. So do not take it for granted um, that experience speaks to just live job experience. Any leadership role you've led in life, if you are the oldest sibling of your family, you've had a certain amount of responsibility, you can bring that context into that interview um, in order to capture, um, you know, um, uh, your, your, the attention of your potential employer. So I think a lot of contextualizing 
of whatever your 18 or 19 years on life on, on earth have been um, speaks to experience. And yeah, I would say that those four aspects uh, would propel you in, in, a, in preparing for your job interview. So attitude, interpersonal skill set. Um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, if people have been listening, <laughs> interpersonal uh, skill set, technical know-how. Know yeah. <laughs> yes, technical know-how, and uh, you know, and the last one is of course um, experience to date before you um, enter the the interview room. All right, uh, thank you so much. Well said, uh, Juliana. I will not add anything to that. We'll move on to Ndiamuhe uh, Mark, Mark, who says that. I think this is going to seek again because he's saying that how best can a new idea be funded? How best can a new idea be funded, mm. Mark? Yeah. yeah, we've seen you giving out $5,000, $10,000. Yeah. So how can an idea get funded? The, the shortcut, the short answer is no one funds ideas. Mm. Um, ideas go through five stages. And it's a very important revelation that, that you know, I, I've come across. They go through five stages. So you have an idea, and that idea, you know, normally you're walking on the street, so you're taking a shower, and you're hit with an idea, and you think, oh, my God, I'm the next Bill Gates. Uh, that's how ideas come. So you have an idea, and then you go into what we call uh, bootstrapping. You know, you have to use your family, friends, uh, other people have said fools because you go to a, a guy and tell him this idea is going to be the new NSSF and they believe you, mm. you know. Uh, so, so that's the first stage. Uh, you, you, you can use uh, people, uh, you know, family, friends to get that. And then the most important thing for you to do uh, if you have an idea is to not look for money. It's to build what we call a minimum viable product. Know, some some evidence so sh show some skin in the game show that you're, you're interested in what you're doing you're just not coming with an idea and you have not invested anything you should be able to say so I came up with this idea I put in you know X number of hours months years in trying to get it to this level now once you're at that level then you qualify for what we call say angel investing where uh, people, you know, high net worth, you know, people like Barbara, like, you know, can 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 invest in you, you know. So, Sorry. but angel <laughs> investing is, uh, and, and that's what we're trying to also build, that you can convince someone mm. to invest in your idea, not that you need money from them, but you need their social capital, yes, uh, you need their mentorship, mm. you need their business knowledge, you know. So they say. If you want money, if uh, ask for advice, you know. If, but if you go asking for money, then no, no one takes you seriously. So seek advice from what we call an angel investor. Look at the social capital, uh, and and then uh, they will give you. If they believe in the idea, if you put some skin in the game, if you have a minimum viable product, then you've taken uh, a level uh, seriously. Then from bootstrapping, uh, most people go to what is called, you know, a seed stage fin financing, where you have gotten some money, you have a product, you've proven a case. Um, then you can go on to other levels of financing. The biggest danger is that we think that an idea is a business. A good idea is not a good business. Uh, idea is just one percent. Ninety-nine percent is making it work is the execution. That's where the hard work already begins. Mm. So people will only be, take you seriously if you can talk to what you've done, you know, not uh, what you need. Talk to what you've done, show what you've done, show how far you've gone, and also know exactly what you need from the other person. You know, I'm here for advice, I'm here for mentorship, I'm here for social capital. I'm here for what do you think I should do next? Mm. But ideas rarely get financed. Yeah. All right. I thank you, CK. There's a very interesting question here. Whoever wants to take it on, I will let you uh, decide. Uh, my, uh, this is Brian Nyakojo who says that how different is a job from a career? 
who would like to take this on? Geoffrey, Barbara, Juliana, CK? No, I, I, think, I think I love that question. Okay. Uh, because it it's, it's the center of almost uh, my own career and what I've done. So there are three things. There's a mm. job, there's a calling, and there's a career. Mm. You know? A job, a calling, and a mm. career. Okay. So a job is, uh, okay. is I wake up 8 to 5 to come and do A, B, C, D. You know, because I can't find any other job. Um, and, and, you know, I do it for the money. You know, if mm. the next job came, um, I'd probably, you know, take, take it without thinking mm. um, and, and move to the next job. So if you are job level, your, your motivation is really the, probably the money, the short-term needs. Uh, okay, these guys are giving me 50000 more. I'll move to that. And we have, unfortunately, so many people operating at job level, right? Um, a career is like, you know, Barbara's, you know, long career in marketing and communications. You know, your long career in the media, you know, and how, you know, you want to end up, I don't know which media house globally, you know. So at that point, when you're being in a career moment, you'll be patient for difficult things you will encounter during that career uh, as long as it's, t it's on the path to taking you to where you want, you want to go. So careers span time, span, you know, it's more professional. Uh, you're going to be known as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a marketeer, as a media person. Uh, it's beyond the job. You've, you've actually uh, uh, achieved that level of just the satisfaction of I have a job, but you also want to make a contribution in a particular field. Mm -hmm. Now, the one they didn't add for me, which is the calling, is you want to leave a legacy. You want to make a contribution. You want to build your community. You want to um, create change. You want to, you know, that, that now goes beyond, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a career and a, and a job. So my job is to make sure more people are at a calling level than, than just a job of... of, 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 of. <laughs> On its own. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Jopra would like to add something to that. How different is a job from it's a career? Okay. So uh, I'm going to demonstrate example. Yes. There is an accountant in town whose name I'm not actually mention, who got into a company as a very young man. And, and, and when he got there, they were looking for people to do the cleaning work for the company. Mm -hmm. So he got a job there to go and do a cleaning thing, you know. So he goes in there. They were being paid so little. So when he's doing the cleaning, he meets people that come into the company and go out. And someone who knew him offers him a job elsewhere and says, you can't, I mean, with your degree and, and with your accounting and all the stuff that you have, you know, put in money, you can't be doing a cleaning job. We can offer you a job as a customer service, you know, um, officer somewhere, where they were going to be paying about 10 times more than was earning as a cleaner. And, and, and says, you know, you know what, I'll, I'll not leave. The company that I'm working for gives me the other accountant. And I realize that even when I stay since that, that I will eventually become an accountant. So this guy actually doesn't work. So mm. He stays to earn the little money that he gets, but because his long-term dream is, if I stay, I'm likely to become an accountant. If I go out, it might be harder for me to get the same environment that is going to be training for free, where I'm going to speak to seniors who have done it earlier. So this guy, long story short, he stays in there and, and does I think there's another two, three years. Eventually, he's taken on as an account assistant, okay? As we speak now, he's done accounting, I think, for over 30 years. He could have chosen to leave because there was a better job in terms of pay. Mm -hmm. He was looking at his long-term career mm -hmm. in accounting. I hope that uh, can help to give them a clear distinction. It was after a job, there was a better job for him. Mm -hmm. There was better pay, but he chose to stay because that pointed him to his actual long-term 
dream. And that simply means that young people need to be very clear and intentional on what they want to become. Totally, and patient. And patient. Because, again, using the same example, this guy could easily have moved, mm. but he was patient. He knew that he didn't have to earn so much money at mm. that moment, but he could clearly see that this kind of company offers me certain growth opportunities in terms of training that I may not be able to get out there. All so right. patience is key. Patience is key. Uh, you just remind me yesterday we had a speaker who said you do not stay in a place for two years. After two years, you go. Depends anyway on what you're looking at. Uh, Nyeko Francis says uh, still that, uh, very good morning, my name is Nyeko Francis. Now during an interview, when asked, what is your greatest strength? Hey, I've been asked this question as well. <laughs> How should one answer this question? Should we give it to Juliana? I think we should give it to Juliana. Okay, yes, please. Um, I think I'll just share my personal story. Yeah. When we finished campus, Bachelor of Commerce, you know, uh, there were so many, like, okay, not very many, but majority of my classmates, uh, some of them said, okay, we are going into banking as tailors. Uh, there were openings in some banks. And, uh, but I really wanted a marketing job. Eh? I really wanted a market, because I was like, I'm interested in marketing. Mm -hmm. And now CK has said that is the career aspect. So I decided not to look for that job. And the jobs were paying better. Those guys were earning about 500,000. So one of my lecturers says, oh, there's a, a, an opening at a Shell petrol station for a marketing person. So I go and guess what, how much the salary was, 150,000. And so I was a sales executive at this uh, Shell Petro station. So no one taught me how to draft agreements. So my, ex my, my brief was find customers, so corporate customers. So my work was to move around various companies that were adjacent to the Petro station, convince them to sign on a month on month uh, like sales contract. And then I would come back if they say yes, uh, in about nine months, I had about, they had moved from 20 uh, corporate customers to 60. So it was because of the passion, you know, I was really interested in building a marketing career. So uh, really I shared that because, you know, as he was sharing and he was talking about it, it is possible if you're really focused and interested in, you know you have a skill, you know you're passionate about something, even if the money is not enough, even if the money is very little, Take that opportunity, provided it's helping you. Because now I've gotten to, to a place where I choose jobs. <laughs> you know, I choose within the career path. Mm. Um, around the time I got this job at NSSF, I had two other big organizations calling me like about maybe six months into the role and saying, uh, can we talk, can we talk, you know? But it wasn't like that. It, it wasn't like that from the beginning. It took time. Mm. And I think one of us talked about patience. You talked about patience. He did. People think that you always, you talked about patience. People think that you just wake up and you're head of marketing and everything is in place. Mm. It takes actually a lot of effort, a lot of patience, and just knowing that I'm passionate about marketing. One day, people will realize that I have this skill mm. and they can actually pay for it. But you have to build the skill, you know. It's not just a one-off thing. So I just thought I would share that story. All right. Just to nail it on mm. the difference between a job and a career. And this is precisely why we're yeah. here. We want the young people to understand that they are not alone. Yeah. Whatever they are going through, they are not alone. That you too as well yes. have gone through a series of experiences to get to where you are today. Yeah. Now, we have a very interesting question from Joseph Oloya, who says that the increased accessibility to the internet on to Juliana. Oh, then yes, I came to Juliana. In. Oh, thank you so much. Um, let me just try to get the question yeah, about strength. Yes, Juliana. Um, Nyeko Francis was saying that during an interview, when you asked, what is your greatest strength? What should one answer to this question? What exactly do you say? Um, uh, that's a tricky one. Back to trick questions. Um, there is no one straight answer for that um, because everybody is unique. Um, you know, my strength might be in creativity or innovation. I'm very innovative. Um, I think it starts from self-awareness uh, 
and that's the work and um, kind of the homework that every young individual should be doing on top of their schoolwork is trying to discover who they really are, what they stand for, what is their purpose or brand purpose um, as you build your, your, your brand um, in this thing called life. So what your greatest strength is should really be um, an aspect that um, not only your peers, uh, possibly even your parents, um, and maybe um, some of your teachers or lecturers have um, spoken or alluded to. Um, so something in life where um, you almost inadvertently are called upon um, um, to deliver. So I'll give you an example. Um, when I, way back at campus, um, when I, um, uh, I was a young lady a few thousand years ago, <laughs> um, I, I remember um, not being really particularly keen on campus politics uh, at Macquarie University, um, because politics generally um, has always been a bit murky, murky waters. Um, but I was prompted or propelled um, to stand for an office, and I'll tell you the office just now, um, simply because of um, you know what my peers were saying as what they identified as a strength of mine. So I, right from childhood, I've always been a very articulate communicator. It's something I enjoy doing. Um, I actually enjoy speaking, elaborating, um, and interacting with people. And so when the opportunity presented itself to stand for office, remember, I was not particularly keen, but I was propelled by my mom at the time, by my friends. They said, why do you not run for speaker of uh, CCE? That time we used to call it Crocodile Hall. And when it started also to manifest in my career, because my original, my first degree um, is food science and technology. So very technical, very um, science-based. I am supposed to be in a lab somewhere. I'm supposed to be a lab technician. Um, but because of the enjoyment and um, my passion around communication, um, uh, around um, storytelling, really, um, I ended up finding my way to what is now my career. Um, in marketing and more recently in corporate relations. So I think for me to understand your strength is to also be very, um, is to start by being self-aware, but also be alert to feedback that you've been getting in your life. So people will tell you, um, you know, for example, Barbara thinks she sings well. We're not going to take that away from her, but what is the feedback around the room? So is she the one to be the lead singer? Perhaps not. So should she be saying that in a boardroom? I don't know. But um, it's also very good to, to, to just be alert and aware of constant feedback you're getting um, and constantly seek it. So you would, by the time you go into the boardroom um, for an interview, um, and I spoke about getting ready and preparing for it, you should come in already having done the homework and researched, what do I know that I do well comes naturally to me and fits within the skill set that organization is looking for? So, um, and not to uh, victimize Barbara, again, if you are interviewing for a, you know, a finance role, is that the time to talk about your great talent at singing? Unless it is going to deliver something within finance and accounting and you have connected the dots, it would be, you know, advisable perhaps not to mention that as your greatest strength, a great singer as you may be. So it is to find that sweet, kind of um, sweet point between what you do well and comes naturally to you and what the organization is looking for. That is the greatest strength you should be speaking of at the time of your interview. Mm -hmm. Very well That's said, because different jobs different really that. require different um, different attributes. So you could be saying you you want to go on TV. For instance, you are saying you want to, to start a, a career in radio, and you're fronting your ability to count money. It just wouldn't really work. Thank you so much, Juliana, for that. Um, moving on and looking at other thoughts, um, we are having... Uh, Vicky, no, Arnold Semogedere, who says that, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Semogedere Arnold, and this is to Mr. CK. Again, what skills do you use as the CEO, Innovation Village, to understand and evaluate the startups in different sectors? For example, in technology, is it a prerequisite for you to know coding before you take on technology startups? 
question. I, I think uh, you don't have to know any coding, what mm. technology is, uh, to build a startup, uh, to build uh, a business. You know, and I know we hide behind technology, but technology is not the end. Technology is uh, the means to the end. So if you know what you really want to do, if you know what you really want to solve for, we just use technology to achieve that. So it's not the, 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 the end. So the most important thing really is uh, what problem are you solving? You know, and we've learned over time not to bet on the idea. You know, always bet on the entrepreneur. Mm. You know, uh, because an idea, ideas don't get better because they are good. Ideas get better because they are worked on, improved. You come back from every failure every day, and you come back better. So an entrepreneur with a great attitude who wants to learn, uh, who's humble, who's seeking out for more knowledge, is, is the entrepreneur we love to back and love to uh, work with. The entrepreneur who has what I call a self-exaggerated opinion about what they are doing, they are God's gift to Uganda because they have this idea, uh, will always struggle yeah. and will always be shunned and will always be um, avoided. So it's not technology. Technology is just a vehicle. It's like you get into a taxi to get to Mbara. That's, that's technology, but the destination is Mbara. So if you're building a business, if you want to be an entrepreneur, what's that Mbara that you want to achieve? How, many, how big is the problem? How many people are affected by that? You know, begin that journey, and then we, we, can, we can pick up a conversation. From there. All right, uh, thank you, CK. This is a question I'm going to give to Geoffrey Sajabi, and it is coming in from Masi Pasca. Simply because you talked about uh, you have a main job and a side hustle, and sometimes there's a clash. You fail to manage both. So she's saying that what are some of the techniques in line with balancing my job with a side hustle, would you give someone who's forced to take on a side hustle due to the so many responsibilities because the main job does not provide enough income? Thank you. Um, it, you know, it reminds me of a, um, a joke that someone once told. So they had so many responsibilities. Mm -hmm. They had no side hustle, so they went to their boss and said, boss, I need you to increase my salary. Uh, and the guy says, why should I? And he says, because I have now gotten more <laughs> children. And the boss says, we'll give you changes in pay based on what you produce at work, not at your home, OK? But, but talking so many responsibilities and needing a side hustle, I, I think Barbara did try to attempt to answer. The issue is that you need to be in a position where doing the other doesn't compromise the other. Okay, so if your side hustle is designed in such a way that it can exist without your full-time involvement, then it's possible. If you've got a structure in place, if you've got stuff that you're doing online, if, if I can post my stuff on WhatsApp and people are buying, okay, and I don't even need to deliver, okay, they could be a delivery guy, okay? Uh, so for as long as you're able to put in place a structure that respects the fact that you've got this full-time job, because at the same time you don't want to rob your employer of their time they are paying you to do a certain job. Imagine having to run out of your office every day, sorry, I mean every hour, because you're on the phone, because there are customers that need a particular bag in your shop, but the people that you put in charge um, don't have enough authority to make the decisions. So every time the customer says, no, I cannot give you 8K, I'll do 40, they call you in, in order for you to make the decision on the last price, okay? Now, it would mean that you've not empowered your salespeople in your side hustle to be able to take charge of the business. Mm. If you have this full-time job and you've opened, uh, and, and I'm giving the example of bugs, so if you're selling bugs in a shop somewhere, and there's this one guy that runs your shop, empower them enough to make the decisions. Because the other guys who are running the business. They shouldn't be calling you, who is in office, to be able to make decisions that concern 
a customer that they are facing. So that guy should be able to determine whether the price at which the customer wants will make business sense or it won't. Mm -hmm. So you need to empower, you need to give them all the skills such that when you're at your job, you focused on your job. Or put in place a structure that you're not the one who's having to run the business. Otherwise, if you get to a point where, where you need to be disturbed all the time to be able to make the decisions in the side hustle, then it's going to kill your job. Mm. And at the same time, it can easily kill the side hustle. Yeah. So, so for me, the issue is put in place a structure that can able to take care of the business. Ensure that the guys who are running the business on your behalf are empowered enough to make decisions without having to call you. Mm. You can check on them maybe once in a way. week or at the end of the day, mm. but you shouldn't compromise the time that you've got in your main job in order to be able to serve your side hustle. side hustle. So if you get to a point where you can't do both, then perhaps you choose one. Mm. Yeah. Structure is key exactly. in, in, yeah. in doing business and ah, the side hustle. I'm sorry, my conscious uh, has refused me to, to keep sit quiet, still. To sit still. <laughs> it will haunt me, um, especially as a person who had side hustle and uh, a job. And I think for me, this is where we need to call on, for me, this is real patriotism or our responsibility as you know, countrymen, countrywomen to build our country uh, and start you know, businesses uh, that can go on to contribute to NSSF, pay taxes, employ other people, right? And I find that the more we uh, have a side hustle thought process, I'm not saying you won't survive, right? But it's a combination of settling for less because uh, you're doing things to survive. You're doing things to barely live, right? And yet, if you, if you look at, and I normally ask people, if you look at the income that's coming from your job over time, uh, it will never be equal to the income you need to live with your family and build a, a generation for them. If you look at the income you're going to get from your side hustle, right? Uh, even that will never be able to su sustain you at the same level of, of, of income or lifestyle that, that you want to live. So at some point, when I was doing a side hustle and a job, uh, a lady advised me, she told me, go do business development. I don't know why, what you're doing in this job. Go do business development, meaning go build your business. You know, go focus. And for me, focus means follow one course until success. That's the word in full. Go build, you know. So we need at one point to really decide and know that we are here to transform we're not here just to do a side hustle to get money to survive. We're here to build this country. And, and as I think about that, just about a, a month ago, I met uh, an Indian, a Kampala City Industries. Uh, does all the tissue uh, in, the, in, 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 in the country. And he introduced me to a young gentleman from Bali who owns no equipment whatsoever, but he has built a brand of, 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 of tissue, right? So he builds his brand and he comes to this factory to manufacture the, the product. You know, and he tells me this young man makes 200 million shillings uh, a month. And then after that, he, he, he showed me what now I call a miracle pencil. You know, a pencil that is made from newspapers. Mm. You know, just by rolling newspapers, and he can buy the pe pencils from you. He can t give you the raw materials you need to make a pencil. You know, so my call is really let's, let's, let's focus and understand that if you're lucky enough to have a job, if you're lucky enough to conceptualize a business, it's not just for you know, the survival. It's really that you, are, you have a responsibility mm -hmm. to build uh, this country and the country we want to see. All right. Now I can rest. Now you can rest <laughs> in a minute. Yes.
Africa's size mm. could then be the distinction mm. between it not just being a side hustle, but business what? Development. Mm. So for as long as you're going to still try to maintain your job while trying to run the side hustle, then perhaps it will stay exactly that. So that's why I say there should be that moment when you make that distinction and you say, let me live by gun, focus on it. And when you focus on it full time, perhaps then it goes into an actual big business other than just staying mm. a side hustle. So you choose which one you're going to prioritize. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, more questions, and I'll, I'll give it back to you. Um, Ruth says that, what is your view on Uganda's rate of technology adaptation? All right, Sike, over to you. A broad question. Mm -hmm. uh, internet access, I think about 45%. Uh, but that's, internet is, is like the road. Uh, what you do on top of that um, is, uh, is now whether we're building solutions on top of, 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 uh, of, of that technology. I think there's a st statistic that shows, you know, the coming of Seth Border uh, was uh, responsible for about over 30% increase in technology usage in Kampala. Mm. Because then all of a sudden, uh, every Seth Border, every border now needed the app to be able to um, access the internet and do business. Uh, and then, like I said earlier, we've had things like COVID-19 accelerate um, the use of technology adoption. So we can't say we are there yet. There's still some uh, obstacles, the cost of data, you know, and infrastructure. It's fairly okay within uh, the city, but you know, not can't be said the same for uh, out there. Yes. But I think for me, the key again is spot the problem in the opportunity. Is spot the opportunity in the problem. You know, uh, build something that can either increase access or can uh, take advantage of already existing opportunities. Okay. Uh, now, Sunday, Vicente is saying that, Dear Juliana, I have liked so much, and I adopt your brilliant submission, that we need to abandon the expectation for fast results in life. Please, could you kindly share an experience of your career path and how you have evolved over time in your career? Thank you in advance. Over to you, uh, Juliana. This is for you from uh, Sunday, Vicente. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Vincent. I think, uh, I mean, uh, without really boring everybody, I will not go through the <laughs> 20 or so years of my career, but to just demonstrate to Vincent that um, nothing comes easy. And I see a lot of uh, the Q&A is dwelling on, uh, you know, nowadays jobs are about technical know-how. How do you, you know, penetrate those walls? Can I just say now that I am... Um, you know, I'm on the other side of the interview panel. A lot of times, I'm the one interviewing. Um, I think it's a defeatist um, to assume that when you go into an interview, um, you know, people have a competitive edge of knowing someone. My first job in life, I read from a newspaper article, um, newspaper advertisement, and I put in my papers. I went through about six or seven interviews. It was a management trainee um, level job, so not even highly paying, by the way, but that is how I got my foot in the door at Uganda Breweries. And believe me, I knew no one, and my parents knew no one there. And even for those people who get into organizations through technical know-who, I think it is very critical to still have the skill set because you can only fool people for so long in a job. So if you got in um, by chance through, you know, that technical know-who, at the end of the day, there's always a seed. And somehow, um, the right skilled people, the people who are meant to be in that role, will always somehow rise to the top. And you will always find that the sharp will somehow be blown off. So I would not be I would not take that view on, on, on job interviews or the site we live in um, currently. Uh, I would go into interviews open-minded, prepare the way I demonstrated before, 
and you know um, give it your best shot. Mm. So in terms of my own personal story, I've already demonstrated. Uh, I've mentioned to you that my first uh, uh, degree in life was food science and technology, and my first uh, job should have been in the lab. Um, but again, through a lot of upskilling and reading on marketing and practicing live practice examples, I managed to get into the marketing department within Uganda Breweries Limited. And even then, when I joined um, at that time, I joined as an assistant brand manager. So you don't immediately get uh, brand management or marketing manager. Those are jobs that you have to earn. And I went through uh, working in different markets. So actually, my moves were lateral. And a lot of times people think that when you join an organization, the only way to go is up. So promotions are only upwards. A promotion can also be at the same level you are, but exposing you to a different skill set. So getting experience at the same level in an organization is also very important. So that also speaks to patience and, and, and not wanting fast or ill-gotten results. So I did that for about five years, um, and I worked across different brands, again, exposing myself. Um, I did commercial roles, not just mainstream marketing. I did customer marketing. I took a risk at some point in my career where I actually left, I exited Uganda Brewery and started in a whole different company, still marketing and sales. But however, at that time in my career, I was actually poised for a promotion within Uganda Breweries. But I took the risk to upskill myself in the sense of getting more exposure in another company, diversifying my resume at the same time and building my CV, such that three or four years later, when again I was hunted, headhunted by Uganda Breweries, at that time I was ready to join the X, which I might not have, I might have joined prematurely, now that I have the benefit of hindsight, had I joined at the time when I chose to take. So I could have joined the expo at that time, but did I have the leadership experience, the technical know-how? No. That took another three, four years of building. And then I have been on this journey of marketing and innovation, as you know, for about five years at Uganda Breweries Limited, if you read my, um, uh, my LinkedIn. And last year, I took another risk. Again, on this path of my career, um, and my ultimate goal would be in general management, I also have some desires around um, public service, um, you know, and anybody who talks to you knows that I am, who, who talks to me knows how passionate about, I am about building Uganda and about giving back to Uganda. I believe there's so much that we've learned in the private sector, those of us who have spent the majority of our career there, that we can actually transfer to um, improving um, the structure and the systems of governance within Uganda. So last year, I took um, what a lot of people see as a risk and actually uh, diversified my career yet again, moved out of the marketing and innovation um, arena into the corporate relations world, where, yes, there is a lot of marketing and communication, but what I'm learning right now and what I'm upskilling myself on is stakeholder management. So a lot of government engagement, a lot of public policy and regulations which for me is a new world and very challenging. But yes, I am not well, and it's taking a while. So that career I'm in now, I'm about in my career to where I want, 16th year of my career to where I want to be. It doesn't happen to me. Sitting on the X of Uganda Braves Limited did not happen in, in an overnight, did not happen in the blink of an eye. It appears with risk, calculated risk, up killing myself. There is no course online that I haven't done in terms of marketing and innovation. There is no mentor that I have not approached. Not all are available, but there are those that I have right now that for me are very in all my decision making in my career. So take a while, take patience, the lot as well. So that would be my uh, submission to you, Vincent. 
Okay, Juliana, thank you so much. I think from your story, we can uh, young people can can gather that uh, it takes time. Really, you don't come from university and straight away you get to uh, the MD of a certain organization. I do, however, believe that the stories could be different sometimes for different people. Other people could. Yesterday, there's a speaker that said, even when you're hardworking, there's that aspect of luck. So uh, as you, uh, because there were some of them said they were a bit spiritual, as you go through your day-to-day -day life, young people also have to pray for some bit of luck in whatever they do, because it actually plays a big role as well. Thank you, Juliana. Well, now Muyombo Eddie says, and I'm going to give it to you, Barbara. I am a graduating senior. I have an established internship with a company called Publis Group in Paris, France. Though ideal to have an engaging working environment, how can one make an impact in an already established institution? Besides educating him or herself on the media industry, how else can one take on such an opportunity when looking to grow? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I think it translates into what should you do your first yeah. 100 days in the office, yeah? Um, first of all, before you get into the organization, you need to do research about the organization. Get to understand what is it all about, what is its mandate, how does it make money, how does it spend, you know, Google their financials, read about the company, and um, visit the premise. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was joining banking, I actually decided to visit the branches. And, and see how they are doing it, how they open their accounts. Because I was going for an interview, I didn't want to get caught off guard. Eh? So visit the premise of that organization, get to appreciate it, so that by the time you arrive, at least you don't feel like you are a very new person. You understand the organization, and you also understand how they operate. That is the first thing you should do. Now, when you get in there, of course, there's usually an opportunity for you to do induction if it's an organized place, they'll usually take you through. So at that point, that should last one to two weeks. Uh, get acquainted with the practical aspects of the organization when you're within the organization. After that, you'll definitely have clear terms of reference in terms of what you're supposed to do, what is expected of you. So then you need to make sure that you deliver on the expectations. If your work is to bring customers no one is going to tell you, go and look for the customers. You have to find ways of getting these customers signed up. If your work is uh, balancing the accounts, you have to find ways of getting it done. If it's whatever it is, make sure that you go an extra mile to deliver beyond the expectation. And then, of course, uh, in the process, make sure that you don't just sit in your corner and do your work. Interact with people. Take an interest in the people who are in the office with you. Talk to them, greet them. You know there are people who walk in and don't greet their colleagues within the same office, and that is already creating negative energy around you. Mm -hmm. Walk in, greet them, that is the previous time. If it is uh, now and they're telling you work from home, when there are opportunities, reach out to someone, call your supervisor and say, I've done A, B, C, D, E, and E. Is there anything else I can do to support? Your attitude matters. Show that you're willing. Don't start with, I cannot. When someone tells you, I want you to do A, B, and C, say, yes, I can do it. If you don't know how to do it, don't say, I cannot. Just say, I can do it, and then ask for further guidance and say, can you please uh, expound on, on perhaps this aspect of the assignment? Mm. So really, it's about understanding, doing your best, and ensuring that you build your social capital within those first few days. All right, uh, yeah. just before you add to her submission, we do want to say thank you so much, Juliana Kagwa. Sadly, she's uh, leaving us at this very point. But we want to say thank you. She is, uh, once again, she's the Director of Corporate Relations, UBL. She's been very open to share experience on how young she has managed to get to where she is now and what you as a young person can pick from her story to better your life. So there you have it. Juliana is leaving us now. Thank you so much. Uh, for being part of our speakers today. Uh, any last words for the young people before you go? Um, I was just saying uh, to the organizers, and thank you so much, Barbara and team, for this opportunity, that um, I'm actually just as enriched as the people who are listening in. Mm. Um, I think the panelists have been very, very open, and um, all of us have gained from each other.
so I would say um, in parting, um, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, discipline, perseverance, um, and really innovativeness um, is the way of it. It's the new norm that we find ourselves um, facing. So thank you so much. So for those that would like to get in touch, we know we can't give them uh, your phone number, but your social media handles. How can they reach out to you? Would like to have that aspect as well. I'm, I'm mostly active on Twitter. Um, so Jules Kagwa, that's J-U-L-Z. Kagwa with a single G. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm on there um, full time. All right, thank you once again. We do wish you a fantastic day. All right, we'll continue with our, our questions uh, with uh, our three speakers that are staying behind with us. There is a very interesting question again from Nyeko Francis who says that I am 25 years old and I feel like a loser. I am single, just completed my bachelor's degree last year. I have a plan to start some business project, uh, projects, but I don't have startup capital. I feel hopeless. What can I do to change my life? Would like to take this on. Okay. Let me take on the softer aspect of the question about uh, feeling helpless. Um, I, I thought it I was do. going to be the feeling single, the being single. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that too. Uh, society has come up with, uh, you know, a criteria that people think defines success. Eh? Mm. How you look, whether you're married, how much money you have what qualifications you have. And oftentimes, this creates like a box. Eh? It creates really like a tight box. Eh? Because then, if you don't look this way, then you're not beautiful or you're not handsome. If you haven't gotten this kind of degree, you have a problem. If you don't have money, so when you accept these things, you can get depressed. So the first thing is just to tell yourself that even without all these things, I'm a person. And I'm, I'm a person of substance, yeah? So, and, and that is what comes, actually, the conversation we've been having around your purpose. Who are you without the job, without the title, without the money? Can you still hold your own? Can you have a positive conversation with someone mm -hmm. even when you, you don't have all these things? Because um, these things actually don't define you. You can get uh, a lot of money, you can get a big car, you can get a big house, but you still feel empty and yeah. lonely. Mm -hmm. You can be married and you still feel empty, even have 100 children. So the first thing is connect with yourself and connect to God. If you are uh, whichever religion you are, try and create that rapport with God because that helps to give you stability internally. That's the first thing. Now, the bit about uh, really, you know, some people, uh, would really make it big in life at 40, others at 50. So every single person has their own life journey. Now you might be saying, I'm 25, I'm single, because perhaps there are some of your friends who got married at 22, 21, 20, and they're happily married. And so when you compare yourself with them, you think that is your life journey. Every single person has their own life journey. And it is not defined by all the other life journeys that the rest have, yes. you know? But you will, you will also get to your point. I mean, uh, I, uh, for example, I'm a much older person and I'm single, but I'm happy, you see. And that doesn't define what I can do with my life or what I cannot do with my life, you see. Because if I was to de be defined by the fact that I'm a single woman and therefore I cannot do anything with my career, I'd be having a problem. I wouldn't be where I am, mm. you see. So you shouldn't allow those things, those things that are not like if something hasn't worked out, it shouldn't define you and it shouldn't stop you in your path. That is the first thing. And the reason why I wanted to touch on the soft things is because your heart counts a lot. The state of your heart, you might not even speak. You might go for an event. And then just the way you're, you're, you're telling yourself, I'm a single person, everyone will see and say, this guy is so sad and lonely. Eh? Mm. And even the single girls won't want to hang out with you because of how the, what is inside is coming out and portraying itself. You know, your attitude speaks even sometimes without you speaking. Mm -hmm. So define yourself by who you are internally. What do you, ha you have a lot to offer the world. You have a lot to offer. So, and when you're offering that, that is the point at which you will cross actually. 
you'll see uh, so many ladies will be rallying behind you and will be looking, wow, who is this guy? Mm. Who is this guy, you know? Because ladies actually like success as well. So really just forget about that pity party. That's the softer part I wanted to tackle. Uh, and besides, I think 25 <laughs> years, yes. if you're single as a man, it's, it's still too soon. To, exactly. To, <laughs> well, no, I think so, actually Francis The other part touches, of the question, I think some of them would like yes, to take on. But I think uh, young people also today, we can touch on it uh, on a lighter note. There's just yeah. something about uh, society putting timelines on when you should do things how and yes. with who. Yes. And I think this is putting a lot of pressure on the women, on the yes. girls. I've had conversations at 25, uh, yeah. 26. They are worried. They're like, oh my God, I am not yet married. I am single. You find it's pushing women and young girls and young boys in, in, in a corner where they're extremely unhappy. And then they're and they taking on anything, any, any person who yes, comes. That comes. And on. that shouldn't be the case. Well, what is your experience? <laughs> taking us way oh. back, uh, just okay. on a lighter note. I, I, <laughs> on timelines and society putting pressures on young people as they continue to prepare, repurpose their career goals. How do they position themselves so that they don't allow these things to corrupt their minds that they're not good enough? Great, so what's my experience? I, I think there is no perfect timing yes. for anything. Mm -hmm. Our journeys are totally different. different. Some people make matter at 20 uh, and they're happy at 40 still. Some people make matter at 40 and they will still find you know, uh, happiness and joy. So, so first of all, being married should not be the yardstick for someone who has actually been able to uh, um, make it. The guy is only about 25, he's very, very young. You know, 25 is so young. So I don't think that on top of his list, when he's worried, marriage or not having a girlfriend or wife should actually be such an issue. Mm. But, but my, my personal story, which is my personal story, is I kept saying that when I leave the university, I, I said if I'm lucky and within two years I've got a job, I want to get a wife, mm -hmm. okay? I always said I need to settle down very fast. And uh, I, I had an uncle who retired at about 50 years of age and he, he didn't have a kid in school, so I kept saying, you know what? So if I marry Ali, mm. within three years I have my two kids. Then I don't think about kids anymore. So when I'm 55 and I'm old and, I'm, uh, and I cease working, any money that I've been able to make is for myself and my wife, not for the children. Mm. But guess what? Even when I married that Ali, the kids didn't come early. Mm. So even when the motivation was like, marry now so you get the kids in two years then the kids choose not to come in two years. Mm. So do you say then that you're not happy, successful? That doesn't define you, mm. okay? I mean, different things happen at different times and we've got to appreciate that fact. Mm. Even for the guys who choose to do um, um, business, there'll be those that will succeed after two years, there'll be those that will succeed after 20 years, after 30 years, but the issue is that if you're passionate about it, you don't give up, you keep trying, You'll fail sometimes, so many times, but then you're not measured by the number of times you have actually failed. Mm -hmm. But your ability to get Two up right again side. every time you fall. Mm -hmm. So a guy of 25 should not be too worried about not being where he thinks mm -hmm. he should be. Time is on his side. So, so my, my, my view is that no one's journey mm -hmm. should be used to define your own journey. You should run your own race, mm -hmm. okay? And with patience, determination, hard work, you'll get there. All right. And, uh, and, 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 and maybe on the issue of the capital, uh, I know that um, CK may uh, say a few things on that line. But again, perhaps one of the challenges of young people is that they look at capital in terms of so much money. Mm -hmm. So you finish campus, you want to start a business, and you want 40 million. Now you, you're saying, I don't have that money. But perhaps we also need to appreciate the power of starting small. Mm. There are people that you can interview. Some, sometimes I watch um, NTV, there is a program where they would interview the um, roadside you know, people who are selling stuff. And, and, and someone tells you how they began a business with 40K. Okay? But it was not actually about the capital. It was not about the amount. One, it was about passion for what they were doing. 
but to it was about consistency yes. and the kind of ideas that they were selling. Mm -hmm. What are you coming to solve with your 40K, 50K, 100K? Mm -hmm. When you speak to some of the businesses today, they didn't begin with the amount of money that they have today. Mm -hmm. So even at individual level, what makes your idea great is not the amount of money that you can start with to actualize it. You can actually start small and gradually people gain confidence. I mean, if you simply beginning, there will be fewer people that are likely to appreciate and gain confidence in what you're doing. But as you begin small and demonstrate that you begin to take those actual steps and the business begins to work, more people will begin to believe in you. And as people believe in you and in your idea, you'll begin to attract people that can actually invest in your business. Okay. But, but I'm certain that CK, they grew in the room in that area. <laughs> it actually art, yeah. CK, what do you have to say about uh, Nyeko's uh, question? Single, just completed their bachelor's degree last year. They have a plan mm -hmm. to start some business projects, but they do not have capital. They're feeling hopeless as we speak now. I, 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 it's a very difficult one. Mm. A very difficult one, because uh, at this point, the problem is not even the capital. And it's I like is the attitude. You know, they say n nothing can help uh, a person with the wrong mental attitude mm. on this world. And you know, so, and you know, it's it's. Uh, I like how Barbara, you know, just like we just get all of her words and put them there. But um, I think there's a psychologist called Meg J, uh, and she uh, talked about what she calls the defining decade. And according to her, the defining decade is the age between 20 to 30. And she says that um, the best time for you to get, uh, to get married, to do anything, is not when you want to do it. It's um, when you, you need to prepare for it. You, know? uh, you need to prepare for it. So she says most people throw away this defining decade of 20 saying, oh, no, I'll do that when I'm 30. Oh, I'll do that when I'm, I'll do that when I'm, I'll do that when I'm. And then when you hit, say, for example, the end of that decade, it becomes a game of musical chairs. Mm -hmm. And you just you know, get the next partner and get married or get the uh, available job because now you think you're either growing old. So I mean, this guy is lucky to be right in the middle there. It's time for him to invest in self, invest mm -hmm. in attitude. Try to under, you, don't, you don't even need capital now because uh, you enter the room with that attitude, no one you know, wants uh, to touch you, no one wants to even, you know. So it's, it's a, a time to uh, invest in self, it's a time to reflect about where you want to go, it's a time to uh, even, even take a year off mm. because you've just graduated. You, know, you need to think of all the options that are available for you and which one you want uh, to take. But more importantly for me, it's, it's a time for you to, to lift yourself up because uh, that's the only way anyone else can help if you, if you lift yourself up. I also think it is during that time when you don't have anything exact to do, it is your time to do the free things, like we're talking about upskilling and uh, taking care of, of, of how you feel about yourself. I do know for a fact that most of us at some point have done internships where you're just given a cup of tea or 5,000 to get back home. So in the meantime, how about Francis, if you look for, I would say an, an internship place or volunteer, work with the uh, organizations that are helping the needy or uh, organizations that give you purpose. There's something I believe if you wake up every single day and you're doing something that you're passionate about, it makes you love yourself even more. So I think young people can invest in that as they wait for the opportunities that will pay them. Yeah. So this is to you, Barbara, because it's for actually to both of you. Uh, maybe you'll see how to answer it. I think NSSF, this is Rugamba Martin, who says that I think the NSSF should start up a venture capitalist fund that will help young people young would-be entrepreneurs in Uganda, such that we as the youth are propelled to have startups that may be funded by the angel investors and venture capitalists. <laughs> Over to you, Barbara and Geoffrey, whoever um, wants to take it away. We definitely will be announcing something in that regard, but it's too early for us to divulge the details. Mm. But 
uh, there's there's some work around that. That's a very I hope that's okay. <laughs> short and straight to the <laughs> point. And yes. That is sufficient for that purpose, mm -hmm. but um, maybe just to add yes. The fund is trying to do some work in the innovation space, and uh, we've got to basically two um, areas. We have what we call internal, that is focused on our own staff being able to come up with great ideas, and uh, if we test them a bit and this work, we should, be, we should help them to scale them up. Mm. But also we've got an external arm, okay? Yeah, we've also got an external arm to the same side, mm. where we've already been in the market for certain ideas, so yes, um, a lot more will be done, and when the time comes, Will be given in the meantime, the you know, uh, as I, I tend not to believe that young people should always look for funding for just I, I feel like the right people always identify you. They always find you when you have a brilliant idea. True. I, and, and that's why Sika, I think, earlier emphasized that the biggest issue is not actually funding. Capital. Exactly. Yes. Just come up with an idea, exactly. and uh, people will find you market it on social media. I just think you could use your social media platforms yeah. to the maximum, and people will come for you. So I hope that has been answered right for you. Uh, looking at more thoughts, uh, more questions, Dean Aaron says that how, what could be the main reason, whoever wants to take it on, why African software developers and software firms don't flourish to a formidable extent that would match our challenge uh, the, the capabilities of top-notch global tech giants. This is Dean Okelo uh, from Chambabu University. Who would like to take this on? Sike? Uh, so it's, a, it's a good one, and one I'm passionate about, too. Um, they actually do, and there's been a shift. Uh, what we are looking at is that <clears throat> we, we, we're, we're catching up with technology. It's not, it has, hasn't always been our thing. For example, in uh, when Uganda was getting independence and we're celebrating independence, people were already walking on the moon, you know. So these guys have had generations and generations and investing in technology. Uh, we just announced the other day that we are going to invest in space technology, right? But in um, in those countries, we have single entrepreneurs who are taking, you know, uh, trips to, to, to space. Mm. Uh, there's a gentleman who's actually mining on the moon, and he's an individual entrepreneur. Yeah, so generations and generations of, uh, of technology. But, and I was speaking to uh, a, a venture capitalist who has put uh, a fund of $100 million, and they're going to set up in Chigali in, from Norway. And they told me 30 years ago, that the biggest company in Norway were companies like H&M, Ericsson. And then a couple of people broke away and started forming startups. Now, the biggest companies, there are two, include startups. So his friend has a company valued at, 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 at $3 billion. So the bad news, the good news is that we don't have to take 30 years to get to where they are you know, uh, to get to that, that level. Uh, that's the that's good news, that we can learn and leapfrog and begin to do that now. Uh, the bad news is that there is a process to do it, and if you don't follow that process, we'll never get there. I know most of you may have seen billboards of uh, a startup company called Rocket Health uh, as you drive, right? I kept telling people, that's not, that's a startup less than five years old, and I mean, you can quote me on this. If they continue at the pace, pace at which they're growing, you'll see they've raised their $20 million uh, in less than two years because that's the process they have to go through. So when you see Rocket Health, it's not a sign of, it's not a billboard to me. It's an announcement of an industry that's coming of age. And we have a long way to go, learn lots of lessons. For example, in Nigeria, Lagos, we have two startups. Three months ago, a startup that was started five years ago called Paystack was acquired for $200 million by an American startup fintech called uh, Stripe. And this is a company that was formed in 2015. Um, another one, Flutterwave, that's in about 34 African countries, including Uganda, just raised $170 million. 
So if it's happened out there, it's going to happen here. The question is, are we ready for it? Uh, two, are we making it happen faster? Uh, and, 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 and that's the call for government, uh, private sector, our entrepreneurs to be investment ready. And, you know, it's, it's happening. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. I know I'm not really an IT guru, but I do interact with IT professionals. And I think perhaps the challenge is, one, the resources, and then two, uh, the persistence. I'll give an example. of I have a friend, actually, who has built uh, the blockchain technology platform for a firm uh, in the US. And it's, it's because they want to do cryptocurrency. But this is a Ugandan here in Uganda who has built that technology. So what could have stopped him from doing it and then shouting about it? Perhaps the money. Because the other people have promised. They pay him money. And then they've also promised him some shareholding. So I think it's just about perhaps the resources and then the ability for someone just to say, OK, let me build this platform, and then it will make money. Instead of us waiting for someone to prompt us and say, because there are many Ugandans actually who are now feeding into global uh, chains. But if they can stand out and say, OK, we are going to do this as Ugandans, even though the funding is not there, yeah. we are going to demonstrate that this works. And then uh, when it works, we shall sell it. Mm. I think that is what is lacking. But the skill is there, and people are doing it. But they are doing it. They are being outsourced because the labor is cheaper, and they are doing it for, for people who are abroad. So uh, yeah. uh, sort of our government policies need to support them. Is that what you would say? Government policy plus, again, back to the individual. Mm. If you're a group of IT programmers and you come and say, fine, we are going to build a banking software, mm. and you demonstrate that it works. Because for this guy to do this thing, he spent like a year in programming, working on the cryptocurrency blockchain. But if you can, and he didn't have a job at the time, but because these people had uh, given him some money, and they were giving him actually about $1,000 on a monthly basis, mm. and then a promise of shareholding. But I think that if someone has self-initiative and they come and say, OK, fine, what's our target group? The government is talking about circles, banks. Let us build a banking software that works. And then they begin to approach banks and say, fine, we have this software. This is how it's worked. We've demonstrated it can actually deliver. Because most of the time, you'll find the banks here are buying the software from companies abroad. Because this port took time, sat down, built the software, tested it, and then now they are selling it. So we need to get to that point where we are proactive. Mm. And we, we, take, we just take something, do it, and then sell it mm. before we are prompted and said, OK, can you do this? OK. Yeah. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you, CK. Thank you, uh, Geoffrey. You do know that uh, we have a survey at the end of every single uh, uh, session. So we ask you to fill in what has been very helpful, what is the one thing that you'd want us to improve for future purposes. And also, you stand a chance to win some of our goodies. The winners will be announced on our social media platforms, so look out for NSSF Uganda on all social media platforms, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, I'm hoping we can also create, <laughs> since we are talking about young people, an Instagram account that is very active. Yes. So back to you, Barbara. This is a question that has been directed to you. This is from Tom Mutumba, who says that I am Tom from Macquarie University. My question is, I am a student. Um, I have side hustle in commercial agriculture back in the village, but this thing is working for me. And yet, after my first degree, the choice is hard, whether to advance for a master's of SCCA or dive deep in this agriculture thing, though I'm studying to be an accountant, which is my passion. So please, according to your experience in life, what's good for a Ugandan youth like myself because currently, the more you spend time in the education system, the more chances pass you by. Please advise accordingly. That is, that is uh, an interesting question. I think this is the reason why sometimes physical interactions are good. I've had those kind of questions, but you know, like after a session, for when you have a physical career expo, then you sit at the back and then investigate mm. and ask more facts. Eh? and then be able to advise. But nonetheless, with the little information I have, if the side, and for me, I'm from that school of, of thought that you can have a side <laughs> hustle. 
<laughs> because you have one. Actually, you don't have one side hustle. You have like three. You said fashion. You said I won't you declare can the rest, but I have side hustles. <laughs> but I am from that school of thought that it can work. Yeah. So, if he's passionate about agriculture, yeah, and it's already working while he is studying, mm. it's okay for him to invest more in it. Mm. His accounting skills are going to help him actually to be able to scale this business up into a bigger thing. Because now, apart from accounting, because I've also studied business, it implies that he has actually done, he has interacted with all the disciplines of business, human resource, marketing, financial management. So together with this accounting skill of his, he can actually set up a very viable agricultural business in the village. Because uh, first of all, he can even scale it into, okay, value addition. And uh, like Sike said, there are various um, like platforms. They recently put up an innovation hub up country. Mm -hmm. There are platforms whereby you can inter go, go to these people and ask for additional support if you want to scale your business from where it is. Because uh, let's assume, let's say, maybe he's into, uh, I don't know which part of the country. Let's say if he was coming from Teso, it would be sweet potatoes mm. or mangoes or oranges. So now, if he can move from that point of just doing the mangoes and oranges and waiting for them and even beginning to do the seedlings, and then uh, looking at who is manufacturing you know, the, the juices, and beginning to supply to those people, and even working with the farmers around. You know, sometimes uh, for development, you can also pull up the people who are around you mm -hmm. so that you build the scale economies. And then step up your supply and also be able to dictate the market price. Mm -hmm. So I personally like the side hustle about agriculture, mm -hmm. and I think it's a good idea. And uh, it already will cushion him, because it's not a guarantee that when he leaves uh, year three, when he finishes, a job will be waiting. It might take some time, but the agricultural thing is there working. So let him work it. <laughs> That's what I think. Yes, okay. I'm really for side hustling. Okay. <laughs> I know you have a different opinion. Um, I, from my interaction with CK, I, <laughs> maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I tend to feel that you, out of uh, this conversation here, from our previous conversations, you seem to encourage more entrepreneurship than employment. I actually don't, mm. uh, per se. Um, it goes down to um, to your personality yes. and your way of contributing. Uh, uh, my own experience was uh, in my corporate job, um, you know, I loved it. You, know, you go to a big hotel and they bring the bill, you just give your business card and the bill comes to the company, the company clears, business class flight tickets, you have things like leave days, you know, I don't know what a leave day is now. So, so you, you need to find out what works for you. So for my personality, um, I reached a point where it was in uh, December uh, around 2017, and I could already tell what I'll be doing in this job five years down the road if I stayed in it. I knew that in in January, this would be the, the thing. In June, we'd be starting annual planning. In April, this is what we'd be doing. So I knew three years, five years, eight years down the road. But personally, uh, I was you know, head of talent. Um, and and there's something that I'll never forget. A gentleman walked up to me and he had worked for this business for the last 25 years. And he comes to me and says, I, I am supposed to retire next week. Right? This really tortured me, next week. And then he says, but I, uh, I still need time. You know, my house is not complete. Uh, my daughter is still in school. If you give me six months, it will be enough for me to put my affairs in order. So it was within my right at that time to just write a letter and sign it and say six months. He's a good guy. Everybody knows him. Everybody, you know, uh, no one would object. It was common practice to extend. So 
six months, I look for him, go to his office. It's a Monday, 7 a.m. Um, and then um, he says, uh, he's not there. I had forgotten six months. So I give him a call. But they tell me, no, he left on Friday. We even had a party for him. Right? So I, I remember the guy, and I give him a call. And um, we speak, and, and then I say, where are you? It's Monday, 7 a.m. Mm. He says, I'm in the garden. You know? So I'm like, okay. And what's that going for you? And he, say, he tells me, actually, I wish I had done this earlier. Because now I have a diversified income. I can take care of my family. I can take, you know. So as much as the job is good, as much as we, you know, it also creates a sense of comfort, mm -hmm. a sense of satisfaction, mm -hmm. a sense of we've made it, a sense of, so it's not that I'm against it. It's that you need to know that you have your prime years, you know, this defining decade. You know, there were, there were times we could work 27 hours a day, you know, just you, now we're on 26, right? So those hours are also best invested in what the things you care about, the things you can do, the things that make you different from anyone else. Uh, so that's, that's really the logic. But then, I mean, if you have to, don't just do it because um, someone else is saying it. What works for you? There are people who are proud to have built a very long corporate career and they are successful in life and they have made it in life. That's also a path. It's not that one path is better than the other. Mm -hmm. It's that which path works for you and which path, when you're eight years old, will make you feel that you lived, mm -hmm. you contributed, you made a difference. All right. Uh, now, the difference is that this time the NSSF Career Expo has been virtual, and that makes it a bit harder for you to interact physically with our speakers. But this is what we're asking you. Please get to our social media platforms. If you have any question for these people, you can just put it there, and we'll see how to ensure that our speakers can respond to that. But also, would like to hear from you on the impact this expo has had on you as a person. What is that one aspect that you feel you're taking away from the expo that is going to make you different? I want to believe that you had your, your, your pens and books ready to take some notes to always remind yourself to, to stay hungry, to keep unlearning, to keep relearning, to keep, you know, doing the things that help you become a better person. Now, as we come to the end of our conversation, I do want to give our speakers a moment, really, to, to sum it up for us. You know how you, you finish whatever, I don't know the best example to give, but let, let's, okay, like dessert. You get, you have your starter, the main course, and dessert. So we've had amazing speakers day one, day two talked about repurposing your, your opportunities, your goals beyond the university degree, how you can match your capabilities to, to fit in the changing world. And here we, we were looking at how we can survive in, in an environment that is versatile. Sum it up for us, our dear speakers today, as we repurpose our career goals moving ahead. The young students in university in their final years, those in second year, and they're thinking, okay, do I move from one course to another? Do I look of, do I think about passion or money? Actually, that's a question that was, was making rounds in the previous discussions. So sum it up for us. L tell us something that we should not forget, at least out of this expo. Who's ready to take it away? But we also have a survey, actually, before they take it. Uh, we have a survey. Do go right there, respond to all the questions there, and you also stand a chance to win. So, to our speakers. Yes, please. Thank you, Sandra, and thanks to the listeners. Um, so, whether you choose to go into employment after campus, whether you choose to start a business, what is undisputed is the fact that you need to look out for challenges that society yes. basically has. Um, if you go into a company as a new guy, as a young guy, you need to look out for their pain points, mm. their challenges. Many times stuff that have been around much longer may not easily notice what is not working well. Mm. So the great thing about new blood, about new people that come into companies, is they don't have the baggage of the company that has been there for 20 or 40 years. So as a new person coming into this company, take advantage of the fact that you can easily scan the environment mm -hmm. and figure out the challenges, 
the pains that that company is actually facing, and that's where you bring your value. What can you help to solve within the challenges and the pains of the company? But even if you took the route of business as your major thing that you want to uh, um, focus on, what does it solve? The things that you want to do in the business, what challenges of the society are you going to solve? And if you solve them well, then that can actually pay you off. Mm. Yeah, sure. Thank you so, those so are my much. Ones. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Jeffrey Sajabi. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Um, one, it's a world of opportunities. It just depends on how you look at it. And I just want to use a, a story that is very popular. Two birds fly over the desert. There's a vulture and a dove. Mm. Each of them will find what they are looking for. The dove will find the oasis, and the vulture is going to find a carcass. So it's about what you are looking for in life. You need to be very clear, and that clarity comes from you. No one is going to tell you about what you should do, what you should be, whether you should be an entrepreneur or a corporate person. That has to come from within. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, this world is for everyone. It's not just for those who have made it. Those who have made it, you've seen the evidence, you've seen the fruit. But there are so many people whose fruit is actually in the ground, yeah, just waiting to be harvested. So this world is for everyone. You can also make it. If someone in the U.S. has made it, you can also be a global icon, whether business or whatever, in every area that you want. That's the second thing. The third thing is when you make it, you have to be able to retain what you have. And that speaks to the question of uh, NSSF. Why NSSF? Financial discipline is a very relevant skill. Because no matter how much money you make in the corporate sector, if you don't know how to manage your finances, it's a big problem. So retirement planning is very important, and that is why NSSF is there, to give you an opportunity to save for retirement. But nonetheless, all these things that you do, you don't have to wait for a lot of money to save it. Start small, save some, some little money, and then invest it and multiply it. So in a nutshell, really, it's been nice, and I definitely want to appreciate every single person here and everyone who has made it possible. Thanks to you all. Thanks to our moderator panel members. Thanks to the crew. Thanks to the marketing team and to, to my, my bosses as well. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, yeah. Over to you, CK. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a hard question to try to summarize everything we've discussed. But for me, I think it's simple. You're not young. If you, if <laughs> you're not young, especially if you're listening to this, mm. uh, it's 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 unfair for you to begin expecting. You know, I'm young, so all of these things have to be done, and you know, looking at that's that's really the foundation. Um, and then once we clear that, there's so many opportunities. This generation today, now has never had as many opportunities, we've never had as many opportunities than, than, than before in entrepreneurship, in business, in, but it ha all has to come back to you. Now, about what we do uh, for a young person who's out there, who's thinking, uh, we've worked with MasterCard Foundation to spread the entrepreneurship opportunity. So we built an innovation hub in Gulu, but even when we're in Gulu, we're looking at doing it regionally, mm -hmm. not just uh, in Gulu. So we have community representatives out there for entrepreneurs. We have one in Jinja, we have one in Barara, in Tinda, and in Bukolobi, we have what we call Motive, which is a makerspace for young people in wood, in metal, in fabric, in media, entertainment, film, art. And that platform provides the ecosystem access to capital access to mentorship, access to market, access to tools that you, you're looking for. Um, so the opportunities are there. We just need to understand which ones work for us, what, what you want to do, and take responsibility, personal responsibility and accountability for the life that you want to live and live out, you know, government at Fiambe, live out and start. You know, it's easier to support someone if you find them on the way. Thank you so much, our speakers, at this uh, Friday.
uh, it's now the afternoon. You, st you, you were able to create about three hours to share with us your experiences and knowledge, and we do appreciate it. Uh, CK from the Innovation Village, uh, Barbara Arini from NSSF, and jo Geoffrey Sajabi from NSSF. I do want to use this opportunity to really thank, and maybe you will be the same people that will take back the information. Thank you so much for organizing such a career expo. First of all, it comes at a time when the young people that have been stuck at home for quite some time, probably their thoughts have been even mixed up with the COVID-19 and they're getting confused on should I carry on with this or not. So I believe this sets the pace for them to get back in the, in, in the act of studying and getting serious about what they want to do with their lives. So we definitely do appreciate NSSF and NMG for making this possible and also for our students, our young people that have been able to tune in from day one to today. We hope you have a broader as a perspective on how you can repurpose your career goals to fit the new normal. It is definitely going to continue changing. Just be ready to learn, to continue and learning, to continue to stay hungry, to keep looking for information that is going to make you a better person. Once again, we remind you to register for NSSF. All you have to do is download the NSSF Go app on your mobile phone and you'll be able to do absolutely every single thing that you want to do. Either register, get access to your money, like he mentioned, you can get that as well. We also do want to remind you of a survey that we've been having every after the end of a session. Why do we want to know? For future purposes as well. And to see your thoughts, how beneficial was this uh, expo for you and what would you like to see different in the next expo? But most importantly, let us keep this discussion online. You can continue discussing as young people, how can you make yourselves better here and there? So thank you so much. Continue to walk in humility. Continue to stay hungry. Continue to look for the people, for mentors. Continue to explore before you exploit, before you get the opportunities that you definitely really want. Here at NSSF, the, the Expo wishes you a fantastic start of your career, and we hope you have an amazing one, one that you'll be proud to tell the future generations. Have a lovely Friday.